Happy Tuesday, good people. What's up? Good to see you. What's up, Afro Senpai? Absolutely, I too love the intro. I told y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get on. I'm gonna get on TikTok dances before my daughter gets old enough, you know, so I can really. It's, it's not about being able to do the dances with her. It's about outshining her at, with my supreme dance skills. But now nah, this is one of the first dances I love. <laughs> it's pretty dope. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in on the TikTok game. If y'all find some good TikTok dances, send them my way. I don't. I don't spend any time on TikTok, but I'm here for the dances. They're simple enough. I haven't, I mean, I've, I've tried this one like once or twice. I'm really gonna spend a day getting good at it and I'm gonna add myself to the intro because uh, I, I, you know, the nostalgia of the songs, all that. What's up, Ken? Good to see you. What's up, Tucker Tech? Welcome, good to see you. Hope everybody's doing good. What's up, Dreaming? How you doing today? What's up, Shrew Food? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see everybody. What's up, Blade? Good to see you. Good to see you. you. Think TikTok is still going to be around by the time your daughter is older? There'll be something else. There'll be something else. Uh, I think. I think. I do think TikTok will still be relevant. It's so big. I think it'll be relevant. Um, but I think there'll be other. There'll be other things. They'll. We'll have moved to. You know, people always like to make things that were big in the past trendy. So we'll probably have a new radio style thing, like something cooler than podcasts. We'll probably go back to like live radio because that'll be the cool trendy thing. And people will be doing some stuff on there, and you know, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out, but definitely, uh, it'll be around. Oh, TikTok and VR. You are right. The metaverse will be a thing. So I just got to make sure my metaverse uh, avatar is the best TikTok dancer ever so that my daughter is. I, I, so here's the thing. I need my daughter to be both embarrassed and incredibly proud <laughs> at the exact same time. You know, you can't, you know, did you, did you really like, I feel like I feel like half of the, the, the fun of being a dad is embarrassing your kids whenever you can. But yeah. What you doing in your free time? Uh, I, so I'm super busy nowadays. Uh, but when I am free, uh, watch movies. I love watching movies. Like we, we watch, we got a, we got a big screen outdoors, a little big blow up screen, cheap on Amazon. First time somebody saw it, they were like, oh man, you're rich. I'm like, nah, nah I got that Amazon money. Uh, it's got this blow up screen for outside. So we watch a lot of movies. Uh, me and my wife love, love movies. Uh, I play games when I have time. Uh, besides that, I love, uh, I love cars. So I go, I, I go for a lot of drives. Like. Usually, like, especially late at night, once the baby's sleeping stuff, I just go for I go for a back roads drive. So I do a lot of driving. I do I do race cars as well. Uh, so I do track days when I can afford it because it's a very expensive hobby. Um, but yeah, I love cars. I uh, love video games. I uh, love movies. Our life will be like Ready Player One. Let me tell you about Ready Player One. Uh, I've never liked audiobooks in my whole life, but. I was driving back from South Carolina. I think I was driving back from Charlotte. Uh, actually, this was 2017, whenever, if you all have never, uh, so I went to a school called UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Sounds like a community college. It's not, it's a, it's a state school. It's, it's a state school in Maryland. Uh, fun fact, the, the place that you might know them from is they beat, they made history by being the first uh, last place seed to be the number one ranked team in the NCAA tournament. Uh, and that was actually, we were celebrating my birthday when it happened, but I drove down to watch them play the second game um, from Charlotte when I was coming back. I needed a way to stay awake. And so I listened to Ready Player One. I've never been able to listen to audiobooks. I listened to that whole thing on the ride back. I actually drove around for an extra hour afterwards because I didn't want it to end and I wanted to finish out the book. It was dope. I loved it. I'm completely okay with our lives. I'll uh, be coming like Ready Player One. I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. The Peterson the Car Museum here in LA. I'll check it out. I'll 100% check it out. Last great movie you watched. Uh, so I'm going to watch The Northman. I'm definitely going to watch The Northman. I want to see it. This is interesting. I, I haven't seen many movies that uh, I would consider to be great. Ah, I'll take that back. Uh, what is it? Uh, every Everything, everywhere, all at once. Is that, is that it? everything everywhere all at once? Great movie. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a better it's a better metaverse movie than uh than Doctor Strange than the new Doctor Strange, which was also a good movie, which is definitely also a good movie. But if you haven't seen that, uh, definitely check it out. It was I I so I never heard of it before before it came out, and everyone kept talking about it. It was amazing. It was amazing. E everything everywhere all at once. Yeah, that sounds right. Really really good. Really really good. I man, I forgot I saw that. Really good. The book is so much better than the movie. It was better than the movie. Ready Player One book was very, very good. What's up, Sanucci? Good to see you. What's up, Sangi? 
Good to see you as well. Uh, Mathmar, welcome. Welcome. Good to see you. Warren Gizzle. I love it. Gas prices these days. Also, I was out at the Lovers and Friends uh, Music Festival this weekend. I got to see Warren G. So, you know, uh, welcome. I hope you hear the real Warren G. Uh, but yes, gas prices are absolutely out of control. Um, I have I have a truck that I, I can't even tell you. I put very few miles on it uh, because I refuse uh, to fill it up. I actually don't even I actually don't know how much the cost the truck costs to fill up because I've never filled it up because it hits the uh, it hits the, the the pump limit every single time. So I don't even know what it really costs these days to fill up. And I refuse to find out how much it costs to fill up. So I have a little mini that I drive around. And it's all good. Slums and RP uh, one I could do without. That's fair. Let's see. Dr. Strange was just solid seven to me. Yeah, I thought it was, I, so I didn't I wasn't I didn't love the first Dr. Strange. It was it was solid, um, but I didn't love it. I this was a to me it was a solid like 7.8. Like right on the verge of being like really like really good. Like I, to me an 8 is 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 really good. I don't give a lot of movies 10s. Uh so like 8 is like is like really good. I think it was it was super entertaining. Um I think it was I I enjoyed the story. Um I enjoyed the story a lot actually. I think they could have gone farther with it or they, they could have there, there's some things I wish they would have done. I'm not going to do any spoilers. Uh but I you know, good movie. Yeah, I mean so this was a this whole he's not really still performing I don't think, but this whole festival was for, you know, all the old heads to come out and people to be super nostalgic and it was dope. Are you there too? Yeah, dope. I mean, like I said, I'm I'm not made for festivals anymore. Uh, I man, I I was exhausted. We were dying out there, but it was a good time. Uh, it was a real good time. So definitely in my future, uh, just concerts for sure. The directors of the movie did the music uh, video for DJ Snake and Lil John. Turned out for what? That's dope. That's awesome. I don't watch Marvel stuff anymore. I keep expecting them to be something they're not. Yeah, that that's fair. So exploring the setting instead of just using it as a setup for fights. That's fair. Um, I I think what's interesting is. I think that they, you know, they, I feel like they did a lot leading up to Infinity War and, you know, to the, to the, the penultimate and ultimate movie. Um, and I think they, I think they spent good energy trying to make that happen correctly. Uh, and I think now the movies that are coming out are much more than just setting up, setting up for fights. Uh, but I did, I still think Doctor Strange was entertaining and I think it was it's one of the few kind of thought provoking ones. Like you, you got to think a little bit uh, as you're going through it. Um, and I, you know, I find that I find that to be a little bit interesting. I also recently saw, uh, so I grew up watching Jackass and I watched Jackass, uh, the, whatever the last one is, the whatever the newest one is. Uh, and man, it was not, it was, it was funny. It was, it was funny because of who I was watching it with, but man, yeah, Jackass forever. It, it was, I, I saw a lot more, uh, there's a lot, it, it, it was a lot. It was just a lot. And I feel like I'm getting, yeah, uh, yes, a hundred percent. Uh, it, but it, it was interesting. It was, it was funny. I didn't, I, I did enjoy it, but it was just, I can't tell if I'm getting a little old. It was just like, some of the stuff was just so ridiculous. Like it wasn't funny to me. And I, I found the movies in the past to be absolutely hilarious, but I don't know, but it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. The, the, the infinity war buildup was nuts. I, I can't wait until another studio or somebody to, you know, invest enough time in a, in a world uh, cinematic experience that large, that many years in the making. Uh, I've I've only had a singular other cinematic, and I maybe maybe cinematic's not the right word, but in TV, in movies, I've only ever had one other ending uh, or finale or wrap up as satisfying as that. And if you've never watched uh, Money Heist, Money Iced, I thought was great, and it had a great ending because they did the they did proper fan service. They didn't they gave you what you wanted. Uh, it, it was a series that needed to give me what I wanted, and they gave me what, what everybody wanted in the end. And that was like one of the most satisfying endings. Uh, as so, Infinity War and the the whole Marvel first clip, uh, I thought it was pretty satisfying. Um, and then, yeah, and I, I would say the only other one that's that satisfying is definitely Money Heist. Everything else let me down. Everything else let me down. Uh, starting with Lost. Lost was the the show that started letting everyone down, and from then on, you know, shows got the build up right. Shows got real good. Started building up, 
you know, and they let us down. Same thing, you know, Game of Thrones, you know, got got a lot of stuff like that. Big build up, really excited about it. Let us down in the end, but it's all good. X Files did it. X Files did it first. See, I wasn't an X Files fan when I was younger. I will pick it up now because I think I would actually like X Files a lot. So now you've given me uh, something, and I think X Files has a lot of shows too. So uh, that will be great. I'm actually excited now that I have X Files. That's a good one. That's a good. I, I'm gonna do that for sure. All right. So today, welcome to day three or week three of Camp Cloud. We are gonna learn about probably the service that you think about the most when you are hopping into the cloud. Uh, actually, I don't mean to go there yet. Uh, probably the service you, you think about most when you are hopping into the cloud, and that is EC2. We'll talk about what it is, what it means, all of the different pieces. Today, we're gonna spend time, we will get hands on on some things because we will have to get logged into one. We're gonna do a little web server demo, talk about that a little bit. So. We'll contextualize the service a little bit for you, but we're going to spend time next class doing all EC2 uh, labs. So we'll do a lab similar to what we're doing today, but with multiple sites. So we'll get a web server up and running and actually learn how to set up virtual hosts and things like that, point it at multiple sites at once. Uh, we'll we'll do, we'll figure out how to, uh, if you lose your SSH keys, how you can recover from that. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, different ways to connect. We'll talk about uh, all, all with a lot of, a lot of stuff. We'll connect new EBS volumes to your system, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we will learn how to do next class. Um, but yeah, that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna cover. So let's hop into Camp Cloud. Slide should have dropped right at seven p.m. They did, and I, I was I got the date wrong for these. I think I did that with Camp Code as well. Let me fix this so you actually see this stuff. I had it set to launch tomorrow. Let's set it to launch today. And how do I just don't I don't need to schedule it. I just need to post it. So there's extra information. I got to update the slides command. I'll do that in a second. Let me uh, post these. Post at the last one. Yes, the last one. Slides. Let me make sure you all can see them. You cannot, even though you have the link. Now you can. Let's take it. Let's copy. Let's go over here. Let's see what my type is like today. Uh, commands. Mm, not good, but that's okay. Edit. Slides. All right, now the slides command should work with the updated slides. So hop in, get your slides going and get ready. I'm gonna do a typing test because every day I do it, it'll be better. So I'm just gonna do two, two 15 second typing tests. Oh, Phil, will a school change line plan set? These are house become run. Oh, ah, right. We are ah, really messed up there. Become it threw me off. It threw me off. Hold on. Hold on. Here we go. If and in. Oh, my gosh. To use same real seam. My left hand, my left hand right now is feeling off. Hold on. My left hand is feeling really off right now. Let me, let me scoot my keyboard over to the left a little bit. Maybe that's the problem. I'm gonna go slow. Become interest never. The between never group. Word order. Begin interest from the plan point. Okay, a little bit faster. I'm gonna do one more. See y'all. Y'all see I'm getting better. If you're not, if you haven't seen me getting better, you haven't been watching because I was in the 40s, I was in the 50s. Now I'm in the 60s and 70s. Even when I'm doing bad, which I'm still doing not great today. So I'm gonna do one more, see if I can get over 75, and that'll be great. Oh, okay, start over because <laughs> that's a terrible start. This run leaves small without. Oh no. Oh man, it's it's definitely my left hand. Mm. I'm trying too hard. Last one. Done. Can't do it. Can't do it. I am off. I'm off. 
I'm off, but I was getting there. Uh, bread and chicken, if you want the slides for today, or if you want to join the classroom for today, it's uh, exclamation point cloud classroom. That classroom command is old. I'm actually going to delete it. Uh, commands delete, I think. Classroom. Yeah, all right, classroom's gone. So cloud classroom, that'll get you in to the classroom for this course. All right, let's get it started because we have a lot to talk about today, a whole lot of information in today's class. So feel free, get your questions ready, write them all down, ask any questions that you need. But here we go. EC2 plus Linux, you will learn a little bit, a little bit of Linux today. Had to throw it in here because we've learned a little bit of Linux in every other class so far. But we are going to learn a little bit of Linux today because uh, you won't be able to do a lot with EC2 without it. Melky, what's good? Exclamation point. Shout out to Melky Dev. Uh, if you all are not following Melky, uh, you are doing yourself a disservice. If you want to have a good time while programming, if you want to feel the vibes, if you want to learn a ton, Melky's pretty dope. He works at a fan company as well. So super, 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 super smart. He's also pretty strong, squats a lot, does a lot of push-ups. But Melky's dope, uh, so say hello. Give him a follow, say hello. What's up, man? It's good to see you. Yeah, Melky, what, what is your squat these days? What's your squat these days? Yeah, got all the way, gotta go all the way down. Now, I'm about to give, I'm telling you, man, I'm about to get back into it. I really, I'm not joking. I know I keep saying it. I'm really about to get into it. That's great. 375 is great, man. Like, I weigh a lot. I weigh a whole lot. So people are talking about my squat. I'm like, I weigh a ton. Okay. So 375 is, it's pretty good. I, I believe every bit of it. All right, let's get started. And then we can talk more at the next break. Whole 65 included in the bar. That's good too. Uh, it, it's interesting. I spent, I spent most of my life, uh, lifting weights for football and stuff. And so I did track and field in college and I, I did the throws. I didn't run. I'm slow. I'm not slow. I'm, I'm quick, but for a very short distance, uh, but I did the throws. So all we did literally was work on technique and lift weights heavy all day. <laughs> um, that's literally all we did. So I got super strong in college. Like I was pretty strong um, in, I was pretty strong in high school. Uh, I actually still have the bench record at my high school, the football team, uh, because I did when I, when I weighed, 185, I weighed 185 pounds and I did 275 five times. And so they, they calculated it out of one rep max and it was like 315 or something. I still got it, I still have that there, uh, but I weigh a lot more than that now. I weigh a whole lot more than that now. But I'm also, I am I am still pretty strong, but uh, you know, you don't need it, I don't need it anymore. So now I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get all slim and beautiful, you know, and ready for the summer, for the beach bods. But we'll get there. So we, we're working on the brains right now. We're mastering the mind. We'll master the body later. Let's do it. EC2 and Linux, I told you last time it was just someone else's computer. Today we'll confirm that for you. What's EC2? We're hopping right into it. Elastic Compute Cloud. You see how that works? I'm gonna have to circle it for some of you. EC2, all right, so it's E, C2, check that out. There's an E, there's one C, there's two C's. We told you that, uh, you know, AWS was nothing but a big uh, acronym soup, and that's what it is. EC2 stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. What is it? Well, it's secure, resizable compute capacity in the cloud. What do we, what do we mean by compute capacity? Remember, we spent some time talking about the different pieces of the computer. We talked about the CPU, that's compute. That's what's doing the actual processing. And so this is resizable, which means you can change the size of it. It's secure, uh, it's compute capacity. It's, it's something that you can rent. It is a virtualized server. It's different from a VPS. We'll talk about that. If you've used a VPS provider like Linode or like DigitalOcean before, uh, we'll talk about how it's different from one of those. Uh, AWS does actually have a service that is akin to both of those called uh, LightSail that a lot of people do not know about. Uh, but yeah, 
this is this is a little bit different, but it is a virtualized server. So we spent, I think we spent a little time here. If not, we spent some time in the Linux course talking about uh, virtualization and hypervisors. Uh, there's some pretty interesting information out there about uh, AWS hypervisors that I could share. But it's a virtualized server. Um, generally, you can get you can get dedicated instances. Uh, there's still some virtualization in that aspect as well, but you can get dedicated hosts here. Uh, but it can be provisioned very quickly and allow applications to scale up and down easily. Like I said, this is probably the de facto service you're thinking of when you think of cloud computing. It is literally a, uh, it's a virtualized compute computing instance, uh, but it's got some cool tricks up its sleeve that we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, so again, uh, th here are the compute resources that you get with it. We talk about computers having resources and those resources you can rent from your cloud provider. Uh, it comes with compute capacity. This is the main, generally the main piece of it, uh, which is measured in V CPUs. So virtualized CPUs, RAM, that's random access memory. Uh, remember, that's the, the thing that stores information. It's very, very quick, but it's also volatile. It's not for permanent storage, and it actually feeds your compute. It actually feeds your CPU uh, information uh, and storage. So permanent storage, uh, non-volatile storage, persistent storage uh, for you to save documents, to save files and things too as well. These all come packaged together. Uh, in the Elastic Compute Cloud, so a little bit of all of these resources here, uh, and these are the these are the resources that you will have to pay for. All right, so there are these virtualized instances that you can pay for. There are different types or classes of them as well. You do not need to memorize all these unless you are taking uh, like the Solutions Architect exam, uh, where you'll need to have a general understanding of most of them. Uh, but we'll talk about it. We'll click this link here. Instance types. Let me go through the slides first and then I'll hop into, oh, actually there aren't any slides on it. So we'll hop right into here. So there are different classes of EC2 instance that you can purchase. They are, uh, they're, they're named very weird. There's no easy way. Like if you've never learned about AWS, you would not be able to hop in and just know what size server to get or what server was right for you. Uh, it will be very difficult to know because they don't have good names. Uh, they're named very cryptically in my opinion, but there's first an instance class. The instance class generally tells you what it is good for. Okay, so because you get a basically full computer with this thing, uh, there are some that are optimized for compute which is CPU, there are some that are optimized for RAM. You might have an application or program that's very RAM intensive. It doesn't need a lot of processing power, but it needs a lot of RAM. It holds a lot of stuff in memory, uh, things like Redis. Um, you might need something that, has, that needs a ton of storage or very fast storage. Uh, and so there are different instance classes that cater to your needs. Very difficult to memorize all of them. Uh, so, here, here's a table. If you click that link and look at these instance types, there is a table here. And actually I'll paste this in the chat if you have trouble clicking in the slides. Uh, but right here, you've got yourself some general purpose instances. And so all of these, all of these are instance types, okay? So max, T4G, T3, T3A, T2. M6G, M6I, M6A, M5. All these are general purpose instances. They provide you a balance of those computing resources, of compute, of memory, of network resources. Okay, they, these are generally gonna be good for most things, okay? Then you get into the specialized instance types. So, uh, compute optimized. Notice compute optimized, most of them start with a C, that's a little bit helpful. That helps you kind of uh, know where to categorize this. RAM, categorized with an R. You might see memory over here and think, why are these, why does it start with R? Uh, these are the, the ones that are gonna give you uh, a, a not so balanced system. They're gonna give you a RAM or memory optimized server. Okay, so faster, more, all that. Accelerated computing. This is, I think this is graphics. Uh, generally, you're gonna use each, to get graphics processing. I think that's what the P's are for. I don't know what the P stands for, uh, but I'm pretty sure you can use these to get uh, to get graphics processing. So 
We talked about video video cards and graphics processing being a different type of compute. It is. Uh, graphics processors uh, tend to do, uh, they favor a very specific type of workload a, a lot better. Again, that's why crypto mining uh, is, people use graphics cards. That's why they force that shortage on graphics cards uh, because they do a specific type of workload very well. So you might need that. Things like machine learning are great uh, to use with these things. Storage optimized, maybe you just need a ton of storage. Punch, bunch of options for that. Look at how, how many instance types there are in each of these categories. There's a ton. Not only are there classes, oh, pixels make sense. Will to thrill. I I think you got it. That makes that makes sense to me. We're gonna go with it. That's what I'm gonna go with. You know, and and I'll, I'll always credit you 100. Next time I talk about it, I'm gonna say the P is for the pixels, and Will the thrill taught me that live, and I appreciate him for it. I appreciate you for it. Okay, I really do. That's help. That really is help. I was literally sitting here like, what does the P stand for? And every time I look at it, I mean to go look it up, and I never find anything. So pixels is the best answer for me. But take a look at all these instance classes, T2, T3, all that. Not only is there instance class, but there's an instance size inside of each of these categories. So you might find a general purpose instance that works well for you. And then you have to look at a size as well. So nano, micro, small, medium, large, extra large, 2XL. Uh, there are ones that go bigger than this. There are four XLs. There are there are a bunch of a bunch. See the oh that's two XL there. Let's find a T two probably has some stuff. Maybe N five. Or maybe they're just only showing up to that. There we go. We look at M five. We get all the way up to you know twenty four XL. Okay. There are instant sizes. So the instant sizes are the same across the board. Like. Um, they all don't have every size, but like the, the the tags for them are the same amongst all of the instance classes. This this can be very confusing uh, because a lot of people think they'll see a T3 and think a T3 is just bigger than a T2, and that's how I determine that it's more. Uh, not quite. They have different features generally, and inside of that class, we will have different sizes. So the class will be first, the size will be second, class first, Size second, let's click a random other one. R5, class first, dot size. That will identify what type of service or server you're on. And you don't have to memorize all of them, like I said, but you can refer to this. If you go work somewhere and you look it up and they got a, you know, they've got an R5 extra large and you go look at it and you're like, what is an R5? 5% additional memory per vCPU than an R4. So, okay, I mean, so maybe I gotta go back and read R4 about what that means or how much that really is. Um, but yeah, it just gives you some some features and some information about what it really is. And you can see exactly how many virtualized CPUs it has, exactly how much memory it has, uh, what kind of storage it works with, its networking performance. So if you need something that's super network optimized, uh, you may need to get something that works for that. And storage bandwidth, this, uh, this matters a surprising amount. Your storage bandwidth is something that people often forget about. They think all I need is is power. All I need is storage, uh, but your storage bandwidth uh, can really be a bottleneck for your applications. Cool. So that's instance types and sizing instance classes. All right, we're moving and grooving. Price and models. There are different, so everything that you do in AWS, basically everything that you do, you have to pay for, okay? You've gotta pay for in some way. Every service has different models for how you pay. They have different models for, you know, for what it's gonna cost you and how they charge you. Uh, these are, these, which you're about to learn now, are specific to EC2. Um, it is worth noting that obviously, if we go back to the instance types, obviously if you go uh, up and get a larger server or service, excuse me, it's likely going to cost you additional monies in the same category, okay? So, you know, you can be, you can be pretty sure that if you're in the same category, as you step up the scale, this one is gonna cost you more than this one. Uh, but there are, there's, there's a couple other things to think about when we are thinking about cost and pricing. So ECG pricing models, 
The first model is on demand, an on demand pricing model. This is you pay for exactly what you use. Pricing is determined by your instance type. That's what we just talked about. Charged by the hour or the second. All right, it sounds wild, but charged by the hour or the second. So because in the cloud, you can spin things up lit on demand. We spin up what we want. We use it and theoretically when we're done with it, we turn it off or spin it down. And so we only pay for the time that it is running. And I'll show you some of the, the, the pricing tables for different instance types. So you can kind of get a feel for what that means and what that is. There are no minimums to this. Uh, so you could literally spin up a server for 14 seconds if you'd like and shut it down. Doesn't matter. Uh, they'll charge you the 10 cents or however much it's going to cost you. Uh, there's no commitment. You don't have to sign a contract. You don't have to keep something for a certain amount of time. Again, if you want to keep it for 14 seconds, you're more than welcome to do so. This is the most common pricing model. People utilize on demand the most, but it's also the most expensive. Okay. The cost to do on demand is the most expensive. Doesn't mean it's expensive. It means it's the most expensive out of the pricing models. How to get good at pricing, uh, like saving. Uh, so there are a number of calculators out there that you could use. Uh, the best way though, to get good at pricing and savings is to have a good understanding of the pricing model of a service. Uh, and you know, once you, once you're, once you're, once you really understand the service offerings really well, uh, it gets easy to see where you can optimize. Uh, I think that was the, the biggest thing for me. I was always using calculators and stuff, but I didn't know about some of these other options. Uh, that you have out here. We'll talk about some of that right now. We'll talk about, as we're going through today, we'll talk about some cost saving uh, things. And actually, before we're done with these pricing models, uh, there's some stuff that we can do that can help. What's up, Red Palms? Welcome to the channel. First time chatter. I really like that it tells you about first time chatters. All right, so on demand, most expensive, but most used option. Um, also important to know, uh, hour and second, we'll talk about that. So pricing, completely determined by your instance type charged by the hour or the second. The next type is reserved. Okay. So reserved instance types you can prepay. So, okay. So usually when you prepay on something, you can save yourself some money, but you can prepay to reserve compute capacity in EC2. So I can, I can go to Amazon and say, Hey, I need, this much compute capacity, I would like to pay for it up front. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to use it, but I want to have it available to me when I need it. I want to make sure uh, I have reserved that for me. And Amazon says, Hey, thank you for letting us know. Um, obviously, if you're buying in bulk up early and up front, uh, we can give you the best discount possible, or we can give you a discount. I won't say the best discount possible, but we can give you a pretty uh, hefty discount. Uh, this does require a one or three year commitment. So you got to say, Hey, I would like to purchase this much compute capacity for a year or for three years. There are different, uh, there are a couple different options for, uh, for when and how you pay there's, there's uh there's, you know, there's a model where you pay for it. You get the most off if you pay right up front. Uh, there's one where you pay a portion of it now and another portion of it in six months and things like that. So there are a couple of, a couple of different options, but the, uh, it will save you the most money by paying for it all up front. So there is a commitment here as opposed to on demand. There's no commitment, uh, here. Uh, there is a commitment. It's also worth noting that you can have, many on demand instances in your account as well as reserve instances. And when you spin up new instances, you don't have to use your reserve capacity. You can uh, use a different model if you'd like. Um, and it doesn't stop you from using any other model, but you can say, Hey, I have a service or a server that's going to be on. If you know for a fact that you're going to have servers that are just going to be on uh, for an extended period of time, this uh, might be the best option for you because uh, it'll save you money if you prepay and if you got some cash, you know, you can't can't prepay if you don't have the cash, uh, but reserved instances will save you a lot of money if you are, uh, you know, if you if you're willing to make that commitment and you know for a fact you are going to have instances running for long periods of time. Why would so before we go to the last one, why would someone do on? Ah, actually, nope. Let me go to the last one. The last one, second to last one, the very last one is not. Uh, it's still a pricing model, but you'll see why we get there. But spot, this is one of the most, I think underutilized 
tools in AWS. Oh, by the way, we're drinking a strawberry bubbly today. It's okay. It's not great. And once I'm done, I've got a uh, blackberry bubbly, which should be good. I think I've had that before. It's all right. But spot instances, highly, highly underutilized. You set a price that you would like to pay for compute capacity, okay? This is like the stock market. You set a price that you would like to pay. When the price drops below that threshold, you are allotted that capacity. No commitment, but capacity is not guaranteed. What does all of this mean? This means that at different times of the day, at different times of the year, different times of the month, uh, AWS would like for people to utilize as much of its systems as possible. And they're, they're constantly, you know, uh, calculating things for their own needs for, uh, expected usage, blah, blah, blah. At different times, co compute capacity, uh, is at less of a premium and the price for it, uh, will go down. And when that, that is the case, when it drops below a certain amount, you can actually have it automatically be, uh, that capacity be given to you and to your machines. You can use it as you would like. And then when the price goes above that threshold that you set, uh, you basically lose that compute capacity. And so basically everything just, you know, everything you had access to kind of stops, doesn't work anymore, uh, because it's over the amount that you're willing to pay. Um, it is. You might be saying, "Why, like, how, why in the world would I want a, a server or or something that I that I might lose access to, and only for such a short amount of time?" Well, when it comes to the cloud, when you can do things on demand, you don't need a long running system. You don't need to pay for something running all day that you're not using all day. Let's say a company has uh, maybe maybe every maybe it's a loan a, a loan processing company and. You know, yes, it's it's super nice if they go through the loan super duper fast, but it's okay if they have a little buffer time. They don't need to be immediate. They don't need to be instant loan approvals. But let's say the loans go through uh, a significant amount of processing. They, they go sit in a queue, they get uploaded, they go sit in a queue and they wait somewhere. And you want, you have to have a, a server to come process them. Well, uh, if I don't wanna pay for an on-demand instance or I don't wanna have a long running instance because I never know how many, you know, how many, uh, applications are going to be in there at a time I can use spot instances and basically when the price goes below what I want it to be below uh, you can actually have it automatically spin up lots of uh, servers for you uh, at that cheaper price it can start to process things from your queue and when it runs out you can basically you know after you lose all of those you can spin up some on-demand instances or some reserve instances to take over maybe you always have some reserve instances that are always processing them and you know when 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 the price goes below, maybe you can have some spot instances spin up and help you to process the rest of them uh, or, or big batches of them, which again can be super duper helpful. People don't use this effectively. There are a number of tools out there that will help you um, with this. Um, I've seen a few of them, uh, spotist maybe, or spot inst, maybe. Maybe it's called spot now, uh, spot. AWS, I think park my cloud may do something like this as well. Oh yeah, spot in is now spot. Uh, there, are, there are like four or five of these that will look at your AWS account and figure out how they can properly use these spot instances for you. Uh, and it can save you a ton of money, but again, it's, it's, it's like the stock market. You got to watch it. You got to make sure that you're going to have the capacity that you need. It's not guaranteed. It can, you know, it, you got to make sure the workloads that you're using these on uh, won't be affected if you don't have them. So uh, spot is your third uh, type. There is one more type, but these, these on demand, the reason why you would use on demand and not always just reserve instances is like I said, you might be running something that doesn't need to serve all of the time. That's just doing processing. Remember, EC2 instances are, uh, you're, they're selling you compute capacity. They're selling you the ability to be able to do some of that processing. And so that's what you're paying for. This is called a limit buy in finance. Yes, a limit buy, 100%. That's exactly what it is. Oracle Cloud has an always free tier that includes two VMs. Yeah, this, this does as well. Um, the number depends on the way that you use it. 
and I'll make sure you don't go over. So yeah, these are the main three that I want you to know about. The fourth, which you can get is dedicated hosts. So remember, these are shared. These are virtualized. There are other systems. Uh, there are other people's virtualized servers on the same computer as yours. So there might be one big server and on that one big server, they might fit a hundred virtualized instances. Okay. Now this isn't like old school shared computing. If someone is over their limit, it, it's not going to, it's not going to necessarily eat up your stuff. Uh, virtualization has gotten pretty impressive and you'll basically pretty much get what you pay for. You'll get the, <coughs> oh, sorry, you'll get the capacity that you pay for. All right. But there is burstable CPU. There is, there's uh, a lot of these instance types allow you to go over your limit. If there is compute capacity available. Now, if you need raw power and if there's, there might be security reasons, there's a number of reasons why you might need a dedicated host, but there will be no other tenants on that system. No other virtualized instances, just yours. So you are paying for the entire server. This is a very expensive option, but it is an option generally due, uh, in my experience, generally due to security reasons. They have gigantic virtualized instances or, or uh, non-dedicated hosts. Uh, so I, even at places that needed major compute capacity, uh, I, I, I haven't seen a lot of dedicated host usage, but it is an option for you. So on demand, reserved, spot, and dedicated host are your pricing models. You pay the most for on demand. Uh, well, so you pay the most for um, dedicated. It's interesting because you can get a you can get a whole dedicated uh, host res as reserved or on demand. Um, but yeah, you pay the most for on demand. You pay the next most for reserved and then spot is the cheapest. If as long as you set it to be the cheapest, uh, I wouldn't really use spot instances if I was going to pay more than reserved. Uh, but you might, there, there might be a case for paying a, a higher rate for spot instances than reserved. If you don't want to be locked into a commitment or you're not going to be using this thing for, for one or three years. Um, if it's just for a short amount of time, spot instances still may be cheaper than on demand instances because, uh, obviously no one's going to pay more when they can just get one on demand. So spot instances will always be cheaper than your on demand. Yeah. Amazon outpost is dope. Outpost is outpost is pretty cool actually. All right. A little bit, a little bit farther and then we're going to take a break. So storage on EC2. This is the piece that gets confusing. This is the piece that's a whole nother service in itself. This is the piece that makes it different from a normal VPS like you've seen with Linode or with DigitalOcean uh, or with LightSail. Uh, this is the piece that makes it different. Storage on EC2. The first, uh, there are different storage types. The first type is the default type that you're probably thinking about, but it is the instance store. All right. This is the instance store. This is ephemeral block storage that backs EC2. What does that mean? Let's break down the words so that you understand what's going on. Ephemeral means not around for long. Okay. Not permanent. Okay. Not permanent will go away. Okay. Temporary. Perfect. Temporary. Sometimes the simple words elude me. Thank you. That is what ephemeral means. Uh, so block storage, we're going to talk. I, I'm 99% sure I have a slide in here about block storage versus object storage because it is, it's very important. When we're talking about this. Let me actually see if it is in here. Uh, actually, I think we do it through the S3 portion. I will give you a, I'll give you an intro to it today. So, um, <clears throat> block storage. This is the normal type of storage that you're used to on your computer. Uh, it saves in blocks to your, to your magnetic disc, uh, or to a disc. It doesn't need to be magnetic anymore, but yes, uh, ephemeral block storage. This is the normal storage that you're used to. It'll be easier to discuss the differences once you know about the other one, but, uh, the other one, so block storage is kind of the, the main type that goes onto a normal disk. Uh, the other type is called object storage. 
And this is what we'll learn about when we learn S3 in two weeks. Um, and the difference is object storage is like a little database. There is block block storage does back object storage. You can, you kind of you kind of can't uh, have non block storage. So the things that are stored in object storage, they're saved. They're saved on some device that uses block storage. But not only does it come with block storage, it comes with other metadata um, about the object and the way that it's. Uh, there's a lot to talk about the way this access. I'm not, I'm not going to dive too deep into it, but metadata is just it's kind of data about data. So metadata might be little things like a name and a location and, you know, a, a type of data or something, but it's just a little bit of data that describes the main data and the way that you access object storage, the way that you interact with object storage is a little bit different. Um, and what you can do with it is a little bit different, but Instance store is ephemeral block storage and it backs EC2. When you spin up an EC2 instance, you will get some ephemeral storage. Why do, why will you get ephemeral storage when we're paying for compute? Well, your computer, a computer that you rent uh, to run it, to run a program, to run an operating system, it, it, you know, it needs a place to have that operating system installed and stored. And so you'll, by default, you will get some type of storage where the operating system lies, uh, that you can boot from and that you can ultimately save things to if you'd like. But since this is ephemeral, you've got to be careful. If you delete the instance, if you if you delete the instance, the data goes away with it. Why? Because it's ephemeral. So if I delete something that is using instant store, if I delete that, if I delete that EC2 instance, the data that is there is gone. I cannot save it. It's gone. Gone with the wind. This is specifically for instant store. That's why you got to be careful with instance store. So you might want to use this when you don't need to save anything. Uh, like I would use it if you don't need to save anything to the hard drive, your, your instance really is there just for compute or you're mounting another drive that you can save to, but instant store ephemeral two important things to remember. And yes, the GIF should stress you out because if you have instant store and you're saving stuff to it, uh, this is how you will feel when you accidentally delete it because you won't be able to get it back. All right, this is the big one. This is the one that you're going to need to know a lot about and that we're going to spend more time with. So not for Docker volumes. No, not for Docker volumes. I mean, you can put a Docker volume there, but again, just know when you, when you remove that instance, it's worth noting though. So, so yes, you can terminate instances so you can delete instances, but you can also just turn instances off. Um, and your, your data will still exist. If you turn an instance off or restart it, your, your data won't go away. It's not like Ram. The data will still exist. It's not until you terminate that instance that the data goes away. So, uh, you can do that. It's EBS, not SSD. It's, it's SSD. Uh, most storage in AWS is SSD. There are options for not getting SSD, but it is SSD. Bitwise, is it all data ephemeral? Yes. How would data be undeletable? Yes, you're right. Uh, yes, all data is ephemeral, but you, you know, what we mean is simply that, uh, th there are storage types where the data will persist. Uh, it will survive a termination of an instance. Okay. So in one instance, an instance store, when you delete the instance, the data goes away with it, that, uh, that instance store is ephemeral, uh, will go away. I guess technically everything in life is ephemeral, but, uh, in, in EBS, so EBS is the other type of storage that backs. EC2, uh, when you remove the instance, the data can remain or the data will remain. So this is non ephemeral block storage that backs EC2. So you'll have one or the other, um, and you can do well. So generally you have one or the other, uh, there, you can use instant store. You can attach EBS volumes to it. Uh, but by default, when you spin one up one of like you, you choose one to back it, only one can back it, uh, first. And again, that's where you're booting off of. That's where your operating system lies either on EBS or on an instance store. So non ephemeral, you can mount multiple EBS volumes to an EC2 instance and the same AZ. Do we remember what AZ stands for? You got it. If you were thinking availability zones. Okay. So you can have multiple ones in an availability zone. 
And honestly, just so y'all, like sometimes you probably y'all are probably like, why is he writing that? I'm writing it because I'm trying to get good at writing this thing. Do you know how weird? Do y'all know how weird it is to like be writing on your screen with something that doesn't have a screen? So it's so odd. I don't know how long it's gonna take me to get used to it, but yeah, yes, Arizona, you are you are correct. Um, but availability zone, so multiple EBS volumes to one EC2 instance in the same AZ. Pay only for what you use. Um, so, so you do pay for storage in an EBS volume, but only for what you use excellent backup functionality via snapshots. These are the, the benefits. This is, uh, not so much this, but we'll talk about this, this though, excellent backup functionality is a big deal. And again, let me just check what slides I have after this. Okay. We need to talk more about uh, EBS because we're going to spend some time with it. Uh, but let's let's talk more because this is one of the most important things. Go, going from an iPad to wake up is a jarring experience. Yeah. So before I was actually using a uh, a Surface a Surface Pro and I was writing directly on the screen. The only problem with that is to do some of the things I wanted to do. I would have to take a screenshot and then draw on that. And uh, you know I didn't love it. Um, and I, I gave away the, I gave it away to my mom because she needed a computer. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to try something new and you know, it works, but it is a, it's definitely a jarring experience. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to write when I can remember to write so that I can get comfortable with it so that one day I'll actually be good with it, uh, for sure. But pay, uh, one, let's talk about this one EC2 instance. So imagine this box is the EC2 instance E C2. Uh, it can have multiple EBS volumes attached to it. So, you know, I'll, I'll do a block over here and it can have another one here and it can have another one here. And all of these are EBS volumes. So you can do a one to many relationship from EC2 to EBS. You cannot do, you cannot attach one EBS. You can't have multiple EC2 instances. So EC2 and another EC2 over here. EC2, and you can't have an EBS volume that's attached to both of them. It doesn't work that way, okay? Only this way. You can have as many EBS volumes as you like, and you can attach them to EC2, but you cannot attach uh, one EBS volume to multiple EC2 instances. Remember, it, it, it can uh, it can mount to an EC2 in the same AZ, so these EBS volumes must be in the same availability zone for you to attach it. If it's not in the same availability zone, you cannot attach it. Uh, this mainly has to do with these are attached. Uh, these are attached in a fancy way, uh, kind of via network. Uh, it doesn't really tell you that, so it's not NFS. If you if you if you know what NFS is, it's not NFS. There is an NFS service, uh, but it's it's not NFS. Uh, but the backbone of it is kind of NFS. And so that's why it needs to be in the same AZ to get the proper speeds and things that you need. Uh, so it must be in the same avail availability zone for you to connect them. Pay only for what you use. This is a very important concept. The reason being is if I have an EC2 instance, if I turn it off, I don't have to pay for the compute. So you're charged by hour or by second. If I, if I have one, if I have an on-demand instance, and I'm using it for 20 minutes and I turn it off. I'm not paying while it's off. I'm not paying for it while it's off, but you do pay for the, the, the block storage that backs it. So if I have an EBS volume that is backing my EC2 instance, I have to pay, even when the server's off, I have to pay for the storage that's being used. So if I've saved 20 gig, 20 gigabytes of data for a job that I'm using, I have to pay for that amount of data. Now it's, it's real, it's relatively cheap. Um, but it absolutely, uh, it can add up, especially if you have a lot of things running, uh, it's something to be aware of. If you cut off a server, it's not necessarily, it's not, it's not necessarily completely free while it's off, uh, or costing you nothing while it's off. If you're using EBS to back it, then you will have to pay for things that are stored. Snapshots. Snapshots are very, very cool. Very, very cool. Kevin, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You know, I, it warms my heart, helps me keep going. I love it. Really appreciate it. Um, 
the, the backup functionality via snapshots. This is one of the best features. This is why you would want to use it. So snapshots are great. Snapshots are a uh, point in time. So snapshot, it's a, a point in time backup, okay? That you can easily restore for, from. So it's very easy to restore from a snapshot or uh, you can actually make another, you can actually take a snapshot and spin up a whole different server. Let's say there was a file that you needed and you don't want to roll the whole server back. You don't want to, you don't want to restore it back to an old date, uh, but you want to get that file. You can actually take the snapshot, restore it to a brand new system, log into that, grab the file and move it over to the other one if you want. But it's great though. The real magic in this is you have to pay for storage. You have to pay for snapshots. Uh, and, and the only thing you have to pay for a snapshot, you don't have to pay to take one, but you have to pay for the storage that it takes up. All, basically all storage in AWS, you generally got to pay for. But what's nice about snapshot is these are incremental backups, okay? So if I take a snapshot today and my server has 20 gigabytes of of data that it backed up okay if the if the snapshot that it creates is 20 gigs and let's just i'm gonna put a random number on it let's say you're paying one dollar per gig so let's, let's say it's one dollar per gigabyte that means this uh while this is sitting here every month i'm gonna pay twenty dollars that's not how much it costs just throwing it out there to make it easy to do so if i if i take one snapshot and let's say tomorrow i take another snapshot and now my server uh, has more data on it. Let's say it has 22 gigabytes of data on it. You might think that every day you take a snapshot, you would have to pay, you know, another $22 at the end of the month. But that is not the case. What, what the snapshot does is today's snapshot only takes the delta. So triangle S for delta, but it only takes the difference between this uh, 20 gig one and this 22 gig one. So. Uh, the second, the first day snapshot, the base snapshot will be 20 gigabytes. The next day's snapshot will only be an additional two gigabytes of data, which is super duper helpful. So I don't ever need to pay uh, a compounding amount to take snapshots. So it's, it's good to take snapshots because you only pay for basically the total amount of, of storage that's on the system rather than, uh, the way that it compounds. It, it works really well. Um, so if I have a thousand snapshots, but my server's only 22 gigs, um, then I'm paying $22 at the end of the month for that thing. And so, uh, that's, that's something that's pretty interesting. We will spend more time on EBS, uh, but there's so many special things about EBS. I wanted to throw some of them out there right now. What if you delete, uh, the data and override it? Wouldn't the snapshot be larger because it has to track changes? Um, Kinda, um, kinda. They've done some magic. Um, so, kinda. In a situation like this, your your best interest, if you're gonna be making uh, that many changes to the server or to the system, uh, theoretically, you just want to build a new system and take snapshots from that. Uh, but it does track diffs. It does track diffs only. Uh, and so, if you were to basically build something up and then tear all the you know, take all the stuff off of it and replace it with some other things. Uh, kinda, uh, I mean, yes, it, it would, because it, it would, the snapshot would show different data, show different information. And so it, it might cost you more. Um, yeah, but again, it'd be the same as if you, if you spun up a new system, uh, it, it's not, it's not doubling the amount. It's just, you've now saved a whole different set of things. Um, and so if you're taking up the same amount of data, then you're taking up the same amount of data. You only pay for the amount of data that's used. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. It just tracks the diffs and the amount of data that changes. Cool. So if you if pay for what you use, so if next month you use 10 gigs less than you used the month uh, before you will pay less money. Okay. So that's super helpful. It's not a, a I can. I can get, I can grab, let's say when I spin up a server, when I provision EC2 instance, I can ask for 50 gigs of storage. I don't pay for that 50 gigs of storage. I only pay for what I use out of that 50 gigs of storage. Uh, and I can always expand my drives. I can always add more drives if needed. Uh, yeah. All right. That's EBS elastic box storage. So the two that you care about instant store, which is ephemeral. It'll go away when you delete the instance and EBS, 
stands for elastic block storage. It's kind of its own service. Uh, it's not ephemeral. You can mount it to multiple. You can mount multiple EBS volumes to one EC2 instance that are in the same availability zone. You only pay for what you use, and they have a pretty cool snapshot feature, which you should definitely check out. All right, before we get into these volume types, let's take a five minute break. Go ahead and get yourself some water. Go ahead and get yourself, uh, go to the bathroom, go do whatever you need to do. I'm gonna put five minutes on the clock. If you have any questions, I'm not going anywhere. Feel free to ask away. I don't know what it is about this strawberry bubbly. It's not that good. When it's really cold, it's kind of good. It's like, it's cool, it ain't great right now. Not gonna lie to you. Um, uh, not in this stream. We're not gonna talk about lambdas, lambdas in this stream. We don't talk about lambdas for a while. Let's see. Oh, I like Spindrift. Believe me, I, I like Spindrift. I only am drinking this because it's free in the office that I'm in right now. Um, We are teaching, we're going over Lambda, not until week 16, so we're only in week three, so it will be a while before we get there. I just downloaded Golang, dope. Now I actually implement the code. Uh, now I actually implement the code via the terminal. Uh, you have VS Code? Yeah, you can open it up in there and create a, create a Go file, so all Go is done through a dot go file and you can just type some go code and run it. Just randomly tuned into the stream can tell you're a great teacher already though. I appreciate that bitwise, really do. Do I like soccer? I do like soccer actually. Uh, I don't keep up with it as much as I should. I spent, I grew up playing soccer. Um, I wanted, I wanted to play in high school. I went to a pretty uh, competitive sports high school. And when I got there, everyone was way better than me. Uh, so I didn't play soccer. And that's when I switched to football. I had only played football one year before, uh, one year before, before I got to high school. I played one year because I was always heavier than my weight class. And uh, I think I played like 75 pounds. Uh, because they do they do it by weight uh, around here, not by age. I think I played this with a 75 pound group, and I think I, everyone was like two years older than me at that time. And I didn't play again until I was in high school. But I do like soccer a lot. Um, I, I just just like all sports. Like I'm having trouble keeping up with all sports. I like I like sports a lot. I uh, just don't just don't get to do it a lot. Uh, I play guard. I play pulling guard and defensive tackle. When I played football, I was small though. Like I was super small. I started, I actually started uh, my junior and senior year at, at guard, but like, you know, high school football is different from college football. Uh, and again, I played on a very, uh, a very competitive team. We actually played the number one team in the country on ESPN my senior year. Uh, and it was fun. We got dogged. We, I, I wasn't used to losing. I only lost two games in my entire uh, high school career. Uh, and it hurt really bad. One of them was the number one team in the country, um, but it was dope. You grew up in a wealthy African-American county, correct? Yes. Is it near DC, Baltimore? Yeah, PG County. Prince George's County uh, is where I grew up. The, it is the wealthiest African-American county in the United States. Um, yeah, the most the most affluent, yeah, the most affluent uh, county, in, black county in the United States. Uh, basketball basketball so uh there's a there's a documentary about it called it's in the water or it's called like basketball it's in the water or something like that uh basketball it's in the water so people like kevin durant uh came from you know came from there uh a lot of a lot of these guys went to my school quinn cook a lot of people went to the school that i went to victor oladipo uh, a couple years behind me uh played played at dematha um and so yeah, basketball county is in, in the water. It's a Showtime documentary, uh, but basketball is definitely the, you know, basketball is definitely the thing. A lot of people play football too, but definitely basketball and football for sure. Imagine most parents wanted their kids to study. Yes, that is true. That's definitely true. Like the thing is, the school that I went to, everyone thinks it's a, it's great at sports, but everyone thinks it's only good at sports, and it's actually a phenomenal academic institution. Uh, and people don't people it gets overshadowed by sports, but it's a. Uh, pretty impressive it's also a really impressive like we have like one of the best like uh like voice choirs like in the country uh it's pretty it's pretty interesting um it's pretty dope it's a pretty dope place for sure 
I did. I did. I, so that's why I played pulling guard. I, I was fullback for a little while, but I, could, I couldn't catch. And, and then we did a lot. Like, for some reason, I can catch now, but with pads on and stuff, I can't catch. And, I, and I'm not that fast. Like, I'm very quick in short bursts, but I'm not that fast. And so uh, that's why they put me at pulling guard instead of uh, instead of fullback uh, at the time because that, I was definitely better at pulling guard. Definitely better at pulling guard. It was, it was very, very fun. Uh, definitely an advantage. People didn't expect to see me coming. Uh, it was great. So I'm about to say thank you so much for all the courses. I'm I'm unable to watch live. I'm watching at least every day. Dope. Absolutely. Thanks for coming through. Uh, configured. Welcome. You know, I, I appreciate you saying hi. Absolutely. Way too smart for football. Played uh, played baseball in college. Baseball. Ba so I like baseball a lot. I am awful at baseball. The reason being, I can catch. I couldn't catch in football. I can catch in baseball. I can play field. I can play field all day in baseball. Uh, pretty good. Like I said, I'm pretty quick, short bursts. You know, I got the, I got, I have the, uh, the reflexes for it and stuff. And I did pitch for a little while when I was younger playing baseball. Decent at that. Uh, the problem is, I have a powerful swing. I swing at everything. I don't care where it is. I'm swinging. I am swinging. I don't care where it is. Every ball has the potential to be a home run. That is my philosophy, and I swing at every single one, and that's why I can never be a baseball player. <laughs> um, in fact, the last time I really went to the batting cages, uh, I like pulled like everything in my back because I was just swing away. I was going for the fence. It was going to be a homer every single time. That's 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 just how I feel. <laughs> But all home runs, exactly. It, like seriously, that's that's why I couldn't play baseball. I watched a lot. I mean, baseball's dope. I, I like baseball. Um, you know, I I'm in Baltimore, so like it's easy to get to O's games. Much easier than it was when I was in DC area to get to uh, Nationals games. It was easy to get to O's games, and they're affordable and cheap. And so yeah, I like I like baseball a lot. I I but I feel like I feel like do kids play baseball anymore? I feel like I mean, again, maybe that's just from, you know, where I'm from and what the kids like to do. I'm sure different places in the country, you know, people do different things. Uh but I don't see a lot of kids playing baseball anymore, which is which is interesting to me. Batting cages with a reliable machine that always pitches down the center, problem solved. Yes, that's the answer. But trying to go to college, I guess. Yeah. Okay, I'm in Los Angeles. Dope. Yeah, so I was gonna um once I found track and field, I didn't find track and field until my junior year of high uh of high school. Um they were having they were having track they were having football kids run track just to get in shape and to do wrestling. I and I wanted to do wrestling, but they didn't have any shot putters or discus throwers and I, I just went out there once and I my very first track meet with almost no training, I won, but it was a tiny track meet that nobody was really at. And there, there aren't a lot of shot putters or discus throwers, like period. Uh, so I won and I was like, oh, I'm gonna keep doing this. And I actually started training and I ended up loving it. I actually really, really liked it. College was dope. I, I really liked it because uh, college is kind of, it's different from every other sport because you don't just compete in your division. You compete against anyone in the country. So uh, uh, Ryan Krauser, the guy who just broke the shot put world record and won the Olympics. I threw against Ryan Krauser. <laughs> like he's six, he's like six, nine. Uh, but, and I, and I went to a school that wasn't the best sport school. We went to Texas. Uh, he was a longhorn and we, we competed at the exact same meets. I threw against him and, you know, I got destroyed, you know, I got killed, but, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of cool. I got to travel a lot. I got to do some good things, but it was dope. Is it too late to join this course? I'm a part of the Go on Linux ones. No, not at all. You, you can absolutely, you know, get what you want out of this. Uh, because we're going over individual services, you can pick up what you want. You can pick up. Uh, it, it, it's easier to hop in and out with this one in particular because uh, the services don't really build on each other in the same way that other topics do in other courses. So I think you're all good. Football is going the way of boxing, becoming more hood sports. Yeah, now nah, it's true. Says quarterbacks. I mean, especially after that, uh, the concussion movie came out. You know, uh, parents are definitely, parents are definitely uh, not letting their kids. Families, like I know, families who who live and breathe football, who's who's who have kids that have gone through uh, good football schools and gotten them scholarships and stuff, who won't let their younger kids play football, who aren't going to let their young kids play football because we're learning uh, the effects. Uh, so I agree. I agree. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a hood sport. I, I, I do think it's going to be that way. Um, yeah. South, probably not the same in the South. I agree. Even though Maryland is technically the South, uh, you know, I, I, I do think that's going to happen. Um, I think basketball is going to continue to get bigger. 
Um, and again, I'm interested. I'm out of the loop on baseball. I don't see, I don't see any kids playing baseball around here, to be honest. Um, so like, I'm pretty interested in that track track seems to be the same as it's always been. Um, yeah, track seems to be the same as it's always been. I think it'll, you know, people will do it. There's so many different activities in track. I think kids will, kids will get into it. Um, but I do, I do, uh, my brother's a football coach actually. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's a football coach at, Mar at the university of Maryland. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard people who've been in, you know, football for a long time talk about like things are changing. Things are definitely changing amongst the parents, amongst what people think about it. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I went up against Herschel Walker and Calvin Smith. Yep. That's what's fun about track. <laughs> that is what's fun about track for sure. Yeah, injuries are real. That stuff is real. The Wire is the best TV show of all time. I disagree. I like The Wire. Big fan. I'm not from Baltimore, so I don't know or do Baltimore, you know, Baltimore things, but The Wire is a phenomenal TV show. Uh, top TV show of all time is absolutely Breaking Bad. I don't want to argue. I'm correct. Breaking Bad, best TV show of all time. Uh, I, I, the only other shows I will accept as as contenders from anyone. You can you can give me the wire. That's one. I'll take the Sopranos as well. Um, Ozark's great. Ozark's is great, and I actually think Ozark might actually be better than it might actually be better than Breaking Bad. But Breaking Bad, when when it came out. We hadn't seen this before. We hadn't felt this before, uh, and so it, it you know it still takes the cake. Um, yeah, I might, I'm, I, you know, one or two other shows might go in that uh, category, but like honestly, I it's Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad is the best show out there. I think, I think, but also think Breaking Bad. My, my dad was a teacher over thirty years, and so like watching watching it happen, like I was like, man, like I like this. Maybe this is my dad. Is my dad? Is he Walter White? Uh, so I don't know. It was just, it was interesting how it, the show pulled me in, you know, and I, I really felt it. The best piece of visual art in the past 20 years, I can go with that. I can definitely go with that. Met a Pacific Islander gentleman who played football, told me stop because of in injuries and wants the kids to play soccer. Uh, soccer, soccer is worse. Soccer is worse injury-wise. Soccer is worse injury-wise, but not as worse, not as bad head, in, like, like with your brain injuries. But soccer, man... Soccer injury wise, it's the worst one. Six feet under, be like, I understand why people know. Hey, I, I've heard good things about six feet under too. Did your dad take impromptu vacations in a bus to RVs? He did not. He did not. Uh, but you know, you never know. Makes you think. Definitely makes you think. R rugby is probably the worst. I agree. All right, let's keep going. We got a little bit more to do. So we're talking about storage here. Let's hop into EBS volume types so the same way that we have so much choice these are the things that you know they just really make aws and the cloud so confusing like there's just so many options uh and so you have a bunch of different volume types when you're dealing with ebs ssds this is the, the default solid state drives uh so you get ssds by default optimized for transactional workloads blah 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 blah, blah. great uh hdds hard disk drives these are older Older magnetic hard drives. This is great for when you need to save a lot for not a lot of money. So a uh, lot more storage capacity, much cheaper to do, to use, uh, but much slower throughput um, in, in terms of storage. Previ previous generation hard drives that can be used for workloads uh, with small data sets where data is accessed infrequently. So uh, this is you know older older stuff that is going to be slower. Uh, you can probably get it for pretty cheap. Um, they even recommend that you just use current generation volume types instead. So there's some there's some options there as well. Um, it goes into a little bit deeper into what each of these different data types uh, or storage types are. Uh, and, and feel free to go through and read through this if you'd like. And actually, I think if you do exclamation point EBS, uh, I think it will come up. I think I did commands for all of these. I did not. Um, when will HDD be obsolete? Not for a long, 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 long time. I mean, we're still using tape. We're still using tape. You can actually get tape uh, through Amazon. You're still using tape. So, um, you know, it, it's cost. There, there, are, there are some people who just need lots and lots of storage and they don't need it to be fast. And so HDD will be the cost effective option for a long time. It'll take a very, very long time. 
what the heck is Web3? Uh, I don't keep up with the news. Uh, yeah, you know, Web3, blockchain, crypto stuff, uh, the new web landscape where everyone is an, is an owner is Web3. At that point, maybe S3 would be cheaper. Uh, yeah, depending on what type of storage you're using uh, that you, or what you need the storage for and the types of things you're storing, S3 is... Uh, an excellent option. And, and for, for a lot of use cases, S3 might be cheaper, uh, but there are some workloads. There are some things that S3 would not work for, um, you know, specifically use cases where the data that's on these things is going to be processed by a system uh, that needs to be connected uh, to a system. You can't really, uh, there's no good ways. There's some hacky ways, but there's no good ways to attach an S3 bucket like a drive. Um, but yeah, don't get me started on NFTs. I, not right now. That's definitely for later. Three and a half floppy still used by military still. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Pump and dump scheme. I, I, I'll, I'll, I will share. Someone asked me at the end of today's class. I will share my thoughts on Web3 and all that. If, uh, if anyone cares, I will share my thoughts on it. But you can go through this page and you can kind of see the bandwidth and how fast things are uh, or, or slow. Um, because it does actually affect how your application can and will perform uh, depending on what it is that you're doing. And so a lot of the, a lot, the hard part about AWS in my experience or the cloud period in my experience is not learning the cloud. It's not learning the cloud. It's, it's instead having experienced enough things to know when these things matter. They give you options for everything. How do you know when this matters? Like what kind of application do I need to care about where I need to look at this. There's math here. Look at all this. Look at, look, look at all this. When do I need to care about that? That is the hardest part, I think, uh, of, of learning the cloud. When does it make sense to care about any of this stuff? But there is a lot of information and all of it has to do with performance. It all is, there, there are all options for your stuff to perform better. There are many, many other types of so general purpose SSDs. There are IOPS. Um, optimized SSDs where you, or provisioned IOPS, where if you need more uh, throughput, you need more capacity to push more things, more read, uh, you can set up storage for that specifically. So throughput versus provisioned IOPS, uh, cold HDD volume. So again, much uh, low cost mag magnetic. If you need lots of storage that needs to be on a file system, for low cost, you can do cold HDD for stuff that you generally don't access, so infrequent access to your data, uh, and you and you want to save some money. This is you know this is this, uh, so lots of options here for what you want to use, uh, but most of the time you'll just be using this gen, this GP3 or GP2. These general purpose SSD volumes are going to be what you end up using. So when you spin up a brand new EC2 instance and you and you choose that block storage. Uh, by default, it'll give you something like this, a general purpose SSD that has solid performance, uh, solid IOP, solid throughput, all that um, for most people's workloads. So it's really nice. So Glacier, Glacier is for S3. Glacier's great. Uh, Glacier is probably backed by tape. I don't even know what Glacier is backed by. Um, but yeah, Glacier, that is a better option. <laughs> uh, generally better option. But like I said, there's workloads. Uh, where the, the data that you're going to access needs to be on a uh, needs to be on block storage. It needs to be accessible uh, from a mounted drive. Um, but yeah, I mean, nowadays I say write a write write some script to just pull it down from S3 if you need it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of S3 using S3 as much as possible. All right, let's keep going. So review. EC2, secure, resizable compute capacity in the cloud. Uh, there are instance types. You don't need to know all the instance types in classes, but there's an instance type uh, that, that that some of them are better for certain tasks. Some of them are RAM optimized. Some of them are storage optimized or compute optimized or graphics optimized. Um, plus a size, like small, medium, large, extra large, 2XL, 4XL, 8XL. Um, pricing models, you pay for what you use. Uh, generally, but there's an on-demand pricing model. That's the most expensive of the options. Uh, it's, it's spin it up and you pay based on this instance type. Reserved, save some money by paying upfront for what you're gonna use. Spot, set a price that you're willing to pay. When the price of compute drops below that, uh, Amazon will give you 
uh, give you instances up to however many you asked for, um, but it's not guaranteed. And when the price goes back above it, you lose what you're using and dedicated host. You can get dedicated instances where there's nobody else on there, even though, even though with the virtualization, uh, no one is, no one's able to come over into your system. I'm sure there are ways possibly to do it, but it's not really a thing. Uh, it's secure enough to where you won't see any of these other people. What's up, C Walker? Good to see you. Been a while. Is BD equal credit balance burst IOPS three used a lot? I don't know. <laughs> Is BD equals credit balance bur uh, burst IOPS? So, so, so burst IOPS are a lot like uh, the CPU uh, limits, and so probably not. Uh, I doubt it. I, I doubt they're used in a lot of uh, a lot of instances. All right. So uh, storage, instant stores, really you, only, you just need to know the difference between an instant store, which is ephemeral, uh, which is uh, basically attached to the instance. If you delete the instance, uh, it goes away. And then EBS, which is, uh, this also backs EC2, uh, but it's the non-ephemeral storage and it sticks around. And you can actually, uh, something I didn't say, which I should say is, yes, you can connect an EBS volume to an EC2 instance, if you can attach multiple ones to an EC2 instance, that also means you can detach them from an instance. So I can, uh, this is where, this is the biggest reason why it differs from a VPS, from a virtual private server, is I get it all together as one cohesive unit, but if I want to, I can detach the volume away from the compute, okay? So I can take, I can take, I can remove the, the, the volume and the compute and actually I can actually move things around if I want and I can reattach a different volume or move this volume over to another compute instance. Um, so that's EBS, that's Elastic Block Store, it has great backup functionality. Uh, you pay for what you use. So even if the instance is off, you pay for the storage that is being used. Uh, what we didn't talk about, I must be missed, I must have missed a slide. Um, I'm gonna go back to easy too. Oh, it must be farther in past the review. Ah, uh, yes, past the review. So ignore this part of the review. I ignore these two parts of the review. This should be later in the uh, in the slides. Cool. So let's talk about some some EC2 uh, terminology and, and concepts that you need to know. AMI. AMI stands for Amazon Machine Image. Remember. Lots of uh, acronyms here. AMI, you'll, you'll hear people say AMI all the time. Uh, you will not hear people say AMI because if anyone says AMI, I will fire them from doing anything with the cloud ever again. Don't say AMI. <laughs> people say it, but you know, AMI, it's an AMI, Amazon, Amazon Machine Image. This is a read-only file system image that includes an operating system and any additional software required to deliver a service uh, or a portion of it. Uh, all this means is this is the ISO. This is the this is the uh, this is the image that's going to run your operating system. So literally, uh, and you you can build a machine image. It's like a it's like a uh, like an OVA if you're used to VirtualBox stuff. Um, but it's the thing that's going to be the base for your uh, for your EC2 instance. So you can literally have an AMI that has you know we have some. You want to run Ubuntu? There's literally, you know, an AMI that has Ubuntu, uh, you know, 20.04 or 21.04. And from that image, when you spin up an EC2 instance, uh, it'll use that. Basically, it'll use this read-only file system that can't be changed. Uh, it'll use that to spin up a server that has all that information on it. Um, and so, it's worth noting that you can build these at any time. You can take those snapshots. That had like let's say you let's say you spun up a server and you installed a bunch of stuff and you saved a bunch of files. If you take a snapshot, you can actually take that to make a new image and create a new snap, uh, create a new AMI from that image. So I can take an I can take a, a, an image, I can spin up a base system, I can install everything that I need for something to run, and then I can export it to an AMI. And so when I'm ready again, if I want to be able to to provision more EC2 instances based on this instance that already has work done to it, I can do that, okay? I can do that. I basically can bottle up everything that I've done into this Amazon machine image. It's gonna be the base image that your systems are created and deployed from. Uh, each image, 
gets a unique uh, a unique ID. Um, the, the the ID is only unique uh, per region. So uh, so yeah. So inside of each region, an image will will get a, a a unique ID. You can copy images between regions, but that is something to think about. We will talk about this later. Uh, but if you if you copy one from one region to another, it will get a new ID. It'll get a new identifiable ID that is different. Uh, so you got to be careful about that if you're building. If you're building an application that utilizes multiple regions, but you need to be building from the same image, it's worth noting that if they're in different regions, the same image will have different IDs. So am I resource tagging? We talked a little bit about tagging. This is metadata. So data about data that you can, um, you can add metadata as whatever you want to your instance called tags. Uh, and again, these tags are used for management. So maybe I have, 10 servers. I'm not going to draw 10 servers, but I will draw six of them. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Maybe three of these are web servers. Okay. So maybe three of these are web. Maybe uh, two are database servers. And one is some type of storage server. Uh, I can add tags. I can add tags to these things. Like maybe I add a tag called uh, called function. What function does this serve? And I can add a tag called web to all of these, and add a add a tag a function db to here. Then. Imagine I have thousands of systems that are doing different things. Let's say I'm supposed to be doing some work to patch just the web servers. Uh, I can use these tags that I put here. I can use this metadata to query, you know, hey, give me all EC2 instances that are running with the tag feature or function uh, that equals web. So I can run queries like this to be able to grab just those web instances if I'd like. I can provide uh, all kinds of things. And there are some features and there's some things that you will use that uh, use tagging for for the, the base functionality. So like giving a server a name is a tag. So it's possible for a server not to have a na an actual name. Uh, and that's because a name is just a tag inside of AWS. Each instance is identified by a unique ID number. But if you want to give it an, a readable name, uh, a tag is actually how you give it a readable name. So this is just for management. Uh, you know, tags are only as good as you're willing to be with them. Uh, so they're as good as what you do with them. Um, but resource tagging, I can give my resources different tags that help me manage them better. Uh, someone brought it up in one of the other classes. This is also good for billing. It's also really good. These tags help you identify what's costing you what from the billing console, and it can be helpful to trace things that way as well. All right, next up, security groups and ports. So we're going to talk about this a little bit deeper, but I'm going to read this and then we'll dive into what it means. In TCP IP and UDP networks, that probably means nothing to you. Uh, a port is an endpoint to a logical connection and the way a client program specifies a server, a, a specific server program on a computer network. All I want you to know about ports is that, uh, let's say this is a server. It's just the bottom of the server, but let's say this is the server and people are attempting to make people from the outside. This is a little person. They're attempting to make connections from the outside. Uh, these servers uh, have to have services that are listening over ports. So they have to have a channel into the system. They have, a w they have to have a way to communicate with, with the system. And so let's say that you have these little channels here, uh, which we're going to call ports. And they have different numbers, okay? They have unique numbers, and only one thing can be listening on each port at a time. So let's say we have port 80. Let's say we have port 443. Let's say we have port 3000. Let's say we have port 8080. 
and 8081, whatever. We're just making up numbers. Uh, these are common port numbers. Uh, each of these ports can only be consumed by one application. Okay, so maybe you have a web server running on this port and listening on this port as a, as, as a lane of communication. Maybe you have a database running over on this port. Uh, once I have something running on a port, I can never have, I can't, I can't have two things listening on a port, only one thing listening at a time. So it's a way, uh, it's a, it's, it's a path of connection. It's a protocol, uh, to connect over a network. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, and so these ports, these ports are important. A lot of the things you're going to do over the web, uh, you know, uh, the, these, the tools and things that you're going to be using are going to be listening and operating over these ports. And it's going to be important to get a little bit familiar with ports and port numbers. But in AWS, security groups are how we are going to lock down our systems. So we, we, we already talked about security being a very important part of AWS. Uh, security groups allow us to create, uh, it, it's kind of your frontline firewall that allows us to be able to decide what has access to what. So we can control what things from the outside can access these ports on your EC2 instance. So you might have an EC2 instance that's list that's running an application that listens on port 80 and 443, but we can set it up in a way that only information can be passed through port 443. Nothing, no one from the outside can access port 80, even though it's ready to listen on port 80, only on port 4 443. So we can control what can connect to our EC2 instances. And these security groups are, uh, are, are, is a set of security rules that we can assign to multiple servers. That's why it's a group, uh, but it's a set of security rules that uh, that determine who uh, that determine you know what can access what a uh, port wise. So this is different from the IAM stuff. It's not what can access your AWS resources. It is what can access the specific EC2 instances uh, through web connections on these specific ports. Okay, our ports dynamic. Uh, like what if I assigned port 80 for something and it was being used by someone else? No, uh, EC2 instances are normal computers. It's not like Docker, uh, which will, you know, set up a dynamic port system for you and just map it to something. Uh, it is not dynamic. If you attempt to assign port 80 to something and you start it, it will fail to start. It'll say, Hey, address is already in use. It will not work. You've got to pick a different port for it. And you'll see how to use security groups tonight but that's what a security group is. And side range, we'll spend more time with this when we go over VPCs, uh, but I just wanna bring it to your attention because uh, we will be using side ranges. You'll see them in while you're dealing with security groups. Uh, also, while you're setting up your internal uh, networks for your system when you're spinning up an EC2 instance. Uh, so I want you to hear about it first. Uh, CIDR stands for classless interdomain routing, and it's a method for allocating IP addresses and for IP routing. Um, the thing that I want you to grab from this, if, you're, if you don't know anything about networking, no big deal. Uh, what CIDR ranges are, are it's, it's a way for you to, uh, it's a method for allocating these things, but it's a, it's, it's also done in a, note, in a notation that allows you to uh, allocate a number, a block of IP addresses in one statement. So uh, instead of having to uh, specify, you know, a bunch of IP addresses, instead of having to say, hey, uh, I want 10.1, I mean 10.0.10.1 and 10.0.10.2 and 10.0.10.3 uh, you can do things like this 10.0 and I'm, and I'm, I'm actually, I already told you all, uh, I think that my networking is my weakest part. Cider, cider block and cider range is being absolutely one of my weakest, uh, parts, uh, for sure. Not afraid to admit that at all, but you can specify a block of, IP, of a block of addresses by doing something like this with a slash 16 or, um, or, or an individual one with a slash, I think 32, I believe. Um, but you can specify a block. You can specify 255 addresses with one little line uh, or more, I think, with a little line like this, but it does help. Um, it helps you be able to allocate uh, many things to your systems without having to specifically identify each individual one. I have information coming to you on CIDR ranges. You do not need to be a CIDR pro to work with AWS, uh, but you need to have an understanding of, of what a CIDR range is because you will see it. 
What's the range start? Can he, couldn't even tell you. Couldn't even tell you. Uh, so I think, I think slat like so. I think if I wanted to specify a singular address, and actually I'm gonna go to side range calculator really quick. Like if I think I wanted to specify this IP address, I think the way that I specify just this one is slash thirty two. Uh, and so this has to do with bits, and I, you know, so bits, bytes, binary. I do understand those concepts. I'm not really sure how it uh, fits here because I never looked into it. I think that thir the sixteen is a lot of IP addresses. I think this is like half, I think 16 is half of the range. So maybe 120, uh, 256. So a hundred and like 50 something, maybe. I don't know. I don't really know. Let's go, let's actually go look at one real quick. Cider range calculator. And let's see. See, look at this. Slash 29. I don't, I don't, I don't know what that means. Um, slash 32. So I'm going to do like 192. Dot one six. Actually, let's do the same thing I was doing. 10. Dot zero. Dot uh, one. Dot zero. And calculate. Uh, this is one IP is in this range. So slash 32 gives me one. But if I change. Ah, look at that. There. Do you know how some, do you know how helpful this is? Why didn't I just, how come someone hasn't just given me a chart like this? What, what, this, this would have been, this, this is much more helpful for me. I've been dealing with this stuff for years and I've never spent any time trying to get any, learn any, anything more about it. Uh, look at that. So giving it a slash 31, uh, it, it references or allocates two IP addresses. So, uh, I must, those two IP addresses are, uh, are dot zero and dot one. And if you drop it down to 30, it's four. So 10 dot, uh, one dot, so one dot zero, one. So 10 dot zero dot one dot zero, one dot one, one dot two and one dot three. Okay. This is kind of cool. I didn't know this. Dang. So if you do a slash one, it gives you two mil. So this is everything. If you do a slash one, you get from zero all the way up to 127.255.255.255, which is pretty impressive. Uh, wow. Ah, so I said this was 150. Yeah, this this makes way more sense to me. I said 150 something, uh, but no, that's completely wrong. Uh, that'll give you 65,536 IP addresses. And so these ranges, you'll see cider blocks like this. Uh, it helps in, so like security groups, you might want to allow uh, a whole company or something like that. And so a company, uh, companies often, you know, service products often, ref, uh, they, 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 uh, publish their their cider ranges that that information will be coming from so that you know what to whitelist you can whitelist all of their ip addresses and they'll give it to you like this because if they have thousands of ip addresses you don't want a list of ip addresses you want something like this that's going to help you uh figure that out this explains a typical slash 24 being 256 ips it does it really does it puts a lot it actually puts a surprising amount into context and i actually can't wait to go afterwards i'm actually going to share this in the Google classroom right now, just because I think it is super duper helpful. I don't want to forget about it. Uh, seems to be helpful. Uh, diving deeper and post it. This is super duper helpful. And I've been on MX Toolbox a million times. I've used MX Toolbox to solve so many problems uh, and I've never actually seen this. So dope, cider blocks, cider ranges, super helpful. Uh, but again, it's 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 a method for being able to uh, allocate multiple IP addresses or reference uh, multiple IP addresses. All right, so now we're gonna make a, a we're gonna make a system, but how do, once we do make an EC2 instance, how do we get into it? Well, we are gonna use something that if you've never used it before, it's gonna feel cool to use, uh, but it's called Secure Shell or SSH, all right? SSH is a, uh, it's the tool, it's the protocol that's gonna allow you to connect to a remote Linux machine, all right? It's worth noting that EC2 instances are not only Linux, but we are gonna focus specifically on the Linux side of things uh, for, uh, two big reasons, one being cost, the second being amount of time to provision. 
you can absolutely spin up Windows servers from uh, EC2 instances, from EC2. EC2 allows for Windows instances, uh, but they generally cost a bit more. It comes with a GUI, all that. So if you're familiar with Windows servers, uh, the way that you connect to those things is through something called RDP. And the connection through RDP is the normal RDP process. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're talking about logging into Linux machines because that's the by far the most common uh, operating system type for EC2 instances. And the way that you log into it to a remote Linux computer is through Secure Shell. They do not allow password login, okay? So you're not gonna be typing in a username and password. And you might say, well, if we can't use a password to log in, what are we doing? Well, you must use SSH key pairs to authenticate. And I'll show you how to do that today. Uh, but you must use SSH key pairs to be able to log in to, uh, to your AWS instances. So make sure, uh, so losing them is a problem. That's why in our lab, I'm gonna show you how to recover if you should lose uh, an, an SSH key pair because that's the only way to, that's the only way to log in remotely. Um, there's other ways to access your instance now. Uh, there didn't used to be. There are a number of other ways to access it, but SSH is gonna be the main way. Um, the, the This is the most confusing piece. You must use, and maybe I'm, you know what? I'm hoping, I'm hoping one day, I'm hoping it's today, that this changes, and no one tells me, and we go to try to log in, and AWS has fixed this. But must use proper OS user. What does that mean? This is the, this is so confusing because AWS does the absolute worst job of telling you what this is. If I if if I spin up if I spin up an instance using uh, Amazon has their own Linux uh, their own Linux machine image they have their they, they they build a custom Linux distribution called Amazon Linux. I think for Amazon Linux when you log in, I and, and actually I don't even know because I don't use Amazon Linux a lot. Uh, the user that you log in at as is, I'm gonna say EC2. I think that's the user, but I could be wrong, it might be root. But for Red Hat based distributions, the user you would log in, the, the user that you would log in as is root. For Ubuntu, the user that you would log in as would be Ubuntu which is super duper weird. And so uh, there are different, there are different distributions. Um, oh yeah, EC2, EC2 user, yeah, correct. Um, it's very confusing. And again, there's no, there's no, they don't tell you like right up front that this is the case. So uh, you might go through a tutorial and you might log in, you might spin up an Amazon Linux thing and you might learn how to log in like that. And then later on, you'll be messing around and you'll spin up an Ubuntu server or something like that. And you will try to log in and you, you'll, You'll rip your hair out because you're like, I know I'm doing this right, but I cannot get logged in. Uh, and it's because you've got to know the proper user for the operating system that you're using, or you cannot log in. Okay. So you will, you can, you can make an SSH key uh, on your computer and then upload it if you like, or you can have Amazon make one for you and you can download it. Um, but just make sure you store this in the proper place or store it somewhere where you won't lose it or where it's backed up. Uh, but you also want to keep it safe because you don't want anyone else to have it because this is how you're going to authenticate with your machine. So SSH, we're going to do that. Uh, security groups. Um, yeah, the virtual firewall that allows you to control inbound and outbound traffic to EC2. That's the important part that I forgot to say, inbound and outbound. You can control which ports can send information out and which can receive information in. Uh, a single security group can be attached to multiple instances. So uh, again, sets I can set some security policies for my ports and apply it to multiple systems. That's what makes it a group. All right, so we're gonna go spin up an EC2 instance and then we'll talk about web servers after this. So I want you to go ahead and get logged in to AWS. So I'm gonna go ahead and get logged in right now. Head to aws.amazon.com or maybe it's console.aws.amazon.com and I'm going to get logged in. All right. I 
I never remember the URL. Yes, yeah, console, and it takes you to the sign-in page. So I think it's console dot aws dot amazon dot com. If uh, if you forgot the URL to get in and get logged in, I'll give you a, I'll give you a second to get logged in and get ready to go. And we're gonna spin up our first EC2 instance, and uh, and we'll learn a little bit about it uh, through the process. It is a super easy thing to do, and hopefully once we go through it once you'll get to see uh you'll get to see why the, you'll start to see the power of aws and how easy it is to make one of these things happen uh and how if you're not careful uh you can cost yourself a lot of money yeah certifications aren't super cheap uh i'll have you i'll have you know that hopefully Hopefully I'll be, I'll, you know, I have so many potential announcements soon, um, but I'm hoping to have a company who will cover a certain amount of certifications here. So as people, uh, I won't be able to, we'll have to do it on a, uh, a rolling basis of like a, a, a refund basis of, yo, show me you pass this um, and we'll, and we will refund you uh, for your certification. Uh, we're trying to make that happen, we're trying to get to a point where we can just, you know, people can just kind of claim them and, and take them. Um, yeah. So if you all know any, any, any channel sponsors who want to help out with some of the stuff, reaching out to a bunch, talking to a lot, talking to a lot of people about a lot of things right now, but the goal, a couple big goals for the channel that I want the first, the first big goal, uh, is to use, uh, that coder platform to be able to spin up, uh, using Kubernetes to be able to spin up. Uh, a bunch of work environments so that anyone who doesn't have access to uh, a computer that's usable to do stuff like this, who has a Chromebook or something that will make this stuff difficult, uh, can can hop right on and doesn't have to pay. I don't want anyone to have to pay any money uh, for a good workspace. So I would love to be able to. That's like the number one thing I will be able. To, I want to be able to provide with. So it's basically VS Code in the browser. You get your own workspace that you can log into. Your information will be saved. You don't have to worry about anything. Uh, that's the that's the first big thing I, I would want to do. Uh, uh, certifications in like Udemy courses and things like that will be second. Um, to make sure people can get access to stuff like that. Um, yeah, so those are, those are like the two the two big ones though. Do I think certifications are required if you're going to shift to cloud? Uh, I think I think cloud in particular is one of the places where certifications matter. The well, not not matter, are the most useful. Okay, so to me, my outlook on certifications is that they are a tool just like anything else. Uh, you're like a degree is a tool. Certifications are a tool to get your foot in the door. They're a tool uh, that you can use to, to, you know, help prove your knowledge. Uh, I think that out of all of the certs, the, the you know, cloud certs are the ones that uh, are the most meaningful to, to companies. Uh, th there are a lot of companies, so, so, AWS will literally, if you're, if, if, if a certain amount of people at your company, uh, have certain levels of certs, uh, AWS will literally pass you business. They'll literally, you become an AWS partner, you become an Azure partner, they'll give you business. So there are a lot of companies who really desire people with these certs. Um, I think the cloud space, I'm telling it is, it's still, it's the space where I think certs, uh, are the most helpful. Kubernetes certs, absolutely. I actually think the I think I think if you want to grab any Kubernetes certs, I think that's super valuable today as well. I'm not sure about Docker certs, but definitely Kubernetes certs. Uh, but cloud certs are the usually when people are asking me about this, cloud certs are the only ones that I recommend, and that's for everyone. Even if you're trying to do software, whether you're trying to do cloud software, whatever, if you're if you are going to be touching systems at all, uh, cloud certs are super duper valuable. Uh, they still are. Um, I will say that the level of cert value is going up. So like, yeah, so like they'll give you cloud practitioner and solutions architect voucher. Yeah, I think, I, I don't think it's worth getting the, uh, those base, the, the absolute base level cert anymore, like the Amazon cloud practitioner. I forgot what the Azure one is called that gives you like a basic overview of their services. I don't think, I don't think that's worth your time, uh, but I do think studying for it is, but I don't think paying the money for that is worth your time. The associate level certs are, I think what you should go for. Uh, so the solutions architect associate, the, the AWS developer associate, or the sysops associate, the developer is the easiest. The solutions architect is in the middle. Uh, the sysops is the hardest of the associate level certs. The professional level certs for Amazon are a little bit different. Solutions architect is the hardest. It's very difficult, uh, but it's the hardest 
Uh, the DevOps one is a little bit easier. I think it was a data one there as well. Uh, oh, yeah, Azure Fundamentals. I will skip those. Uh, the, the Kubernetes ones, what is it? Uh, the CKA, Certified Kubernetes Administrator and Certified Kubernetes Developer. Certified Kubernetes Administrator. So they're all given by the uh, CNCF, I believe, the Cloud Native Cloud Foundation. Yeah. Certified Kubernetes Administrator and other one. Azure Fundamentals is required. Required, really? I will likely never get any Azure certs then. Nah, I'm joking. Um, huh. I really want to dive. I really want to dive into Azure. Like, really want to dive into it. I just haven't had the time. So I'm hoping, Microsoft, if you're out there, give me a reason. I would love to do an Azure course. I would love to dive into Azure. Come talk to me. Come holler at me. Let's get Azure use AWS. Hey. But yeah, uh, the Kubernetes, the Kubernetes certs uh, seem to be valuable because everyone wants Kubernetes, and so little people have Kubernetes knowledge. Uh, it would be valuable. Yeah, definitely at Microsoft <laughs> for sure. All right. Um, so let's let's so now that you're logged in, hopefully I give you enough time. Uh, remember, lots of services here. You don't got to go look for them. You do need to know the service name if you want to search for it. But I'm going to search for E. C2, and I'm gonna click it just like that. That a challenge in December where they give you a free voucher. That's dope. You should talk to Leon. He has Microsoft. Oh, ho, ho. Leon, I'm on the way. Leon, I'm coming to talk. I would also like to be in the same pocket uh, for sure. That would be dope. I Yeah, I need to start using my resources more. Leon, I'll, I'm definitely gonna reach out to Leon. I got the CCP basically uh, free by accident. Dude on Twitter giving away vouchers. That's dope. See, I would love to be able to just give away your vouchers. I would love to. I would love to just give away vouchers. Like I said, y'all know my stance on this stuff. This stuff should be free. This stuff should be absolutely free. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna work to make it so they want us. They want the knowledge. They want they want they want people to be able to contribute and to build their companies even bigger. Make them pay for it. Make the companies pay for it. Oh, due to the pandemic. Dope. I should have took advantage. I really lazy it out. All right. First things first. What I want you to check is your region. Okay. Your region. It's worth noting that every instance class is not available in every single region. It's definitely worth noting. Now, for all of our purposes in this course, that won't matter. You will have the basic instances available in your region. But if there are specialty instances, larger instances, uh, they're not all available in every single region. Something to know about, something to think about in the future as you're going through your AWS career. Uh, you got to see if you know the region that you're working in, if it has the proper uh, instance types or sizes that you need. Change it. Make sure you change it to wherever you need to be. Okay, whatever's whatever's geographically closest to see you, you know, is what I would is what I would use. Um, so go ahead and make sure you're in the region that you care about, and then you get this nice little overview of what's going on in your EC2 service. So this is just EC2 alone. All right, so you get a little overview. How many instances do I have that are running? I have zero instances that are running. This is not worldwide. Okay. This is only in this region alone, okay? This is only showing me this region. It is possible, I see it happen all the time, for you to spin things up in other regions and forget about them, and it costs you money. So be careful with that. Um, this Know that this is only showing you what's going on in the region that you have selected up here. All right, so it shows you the amount of running instances you have, Elastic IPs, uh, we'll spend some time talking about, but Elastic IPs are a way to uh, think about uh, a we, we're talking about with the cloud, you can spin instances up and destroy them uh, as much as you want. You can access them on demand. What Elastic IP addresses allow you to do is to have a IP, a, a dedicated IP address that you keep. Okay, so if you're if you're not familiar with what IP address is, uh, this is that number address, uh, like 192.168.1.1. This is the ad, ad, the address that is necessary for a computer to access another computer over a network. It's like your home address. Uh, that number is unique to a computer over over a network, and that that tells computers how to get to that thing. Elastic IP addresses allow you to keep an IP address, and as you destroy instances and spin them back up, you can keep attaching this IP to it, so you don't 
don't have to worry about if the IP changed because you have a new instance. So every time you make a new instance, you will get a different IP address. And so that can be of concern. And Elastic IPs allow you to have a dedicated IP that you can attach and detach from instances, which is super duper nice. Uh, it's, it's, it's some fancy networking in the background. Uh, I think these are a dollar per month. I think every single Elastic IP is $1 per month. Um, so don't just add them. It will cost you money. Um, cool. Key pairs. Th these are those SSH key pairs. I don't know what the account limits are for these, uh, but you can have tons of them, tons and tons of them. You can upload your own. You cannot download. You cannot download the private key. Once you make it, you can only download it one time. So if you lose your private key, you will have to, uh, make a new one and, or rescue your instance or figure something else out. Okay. Um, there's placement groups. Don't worry about that right now. We'll talk about that when we get to auto scaling, um, snapshots. This is, these are those EBS snapshots, those backups, those point in time backups that you can use to, uh, to restore from dedicated hosts. So how many dedicated hosts do I have? How many instances do I have? So here's instances running and here's instances. This means I have a instance that is turned off. Uh, I'm actually interested to know what that is. Load balancers, we'll talk about that when we get to the scaling portion as well. Security groups, that's that firewall that we were just talking about. And volumes, this, these are my EBS volumes that I have. So only one. What instance do I have that's off? Oh, okay, Cloud9 test. All right, so Cloud9 is another AWS service. It's uh, basically uh, a, a development environment in the cloud, and it's pretty cool. Yes, we are gonna talk about reverse proxy and proxies today. And actually, if you're in the Google Classroom, uh, that's one of the things that I provided in the diving deeper section uh, for the more about Nginx. There's a video in here about uh, proxying and reverse proxying and understanding what that is. We will talk about that today uh, in just a few, actually. All right. So what I'm going to do is let's let's actually spin one up. Let's actually figure out how to use it. So if you're in the EC2 dashboard, let me go back to it. Here's what it looks like. And it's super easy to make a new instance. There's a bunch of different places. I can scroll down on the main page and I can make a new instance by clicking launch instance. Very easy, okay? Or you can click into instances and you can click the big orange launch instance. They make it easy for you to launch new instances. They make it easy for them to make money. And so I'm gonna click launch instance and we are gonna start the process of creating our very first one. All right, I'm gonna scroll down. The very first thing that we have here is name and tags. So right up front, we talked about tags being that metadata that doesn't really affect anything. It just makes it easier for you to manage. You do not have to provide any tags, but by default it says, hey, give it a name so that you know what this thing is. A name so that you can understand what it is and you can easily identify it. So I'm gonna call this, uh, I'm gonna call this camp cloud uh, first instance, you can call it whatever you want. And it's also not permanent. You can change this whenever you want. Uh, it's super easy. We are not going to create any additional tags by default. It gives you name, but if you do create an additional tag, let's say I wanted to make an, a tag called uh, environment, I would have to give it its own key name and then provide its value. Uh, but I don't want a new one. I just, uh, I just want to show you that you can add all the tags that you want, uh, 50 of them. Um, but name is what we have here. So I gave it a name. Then you scroll down. So this is also, uh, it, it tells you up here that I'm opted into the new experience. I've actually, because I don't usually spin up instances from the, uh, from the GUI, from the, from the console. Uh, so a lot of this is actually new to me. So I'm kind of learning along with you because they've switched this up a ton. The next thing is, the AMI. So remember, we just learned about the Amazon machine image. This basically says, what kind of instance do you want? What do you want us to boot this off of? So you can see here, there's a quick start. I could have Amazon Linux. I have Ubuntu. I have Windows. Oh no. Windows, Red Hat, SUSE or SUSE, Mac. You can also use Mac. I completely forgot about this. Uh, I think they just released Mac servers in like 2020. Um, so it's pretty recent. Debian. I can browse for more. Uh, if I have AMIs have a unique ID, if I have the AMI ID, I can use that very specifically, uh, but you can click and see some information uh, about it. Root device type, EBS. 
ENA enabled true. I don't actually know what ENA, ENA is. Uh, different virtualization types. They actually have an older type of virtualization that you can look for. If you need it, it let you know that it's 64 bit ARM or 64 bit ARM or 64 bit uh, x86. Whoa. Cool. And so this is going to give you the latest version of it. Okay. And so I can change my architecture here if I care. Um, for Mac, I actually don't think they have ARM. Uh, which is interesting. I think they only have um, x86 for this, which is interesting, but I'm sure they will get it eventually. But all right, so I'm going to select Amazon Linux to start. And I'll leave everything else default. Just I'll just click Amazon Linux. And this is the image that we'll use to spin this up off of. Then here comes the instance type. Here is where you select the type and class of your instance. So T2 micro is free tier eligible. Make sure if you don't want to spend any money, you're selecting the free tier eligible option. So free tier eligible T2 micro. Uh, so T2 micro has uh, one virtual CPU, one gig of memory. All right, cool. That's great. That's what we're going to use. You can compare instant types if you want to see some more. So that's good. Worth noting again, uh, we talked about this before, but the free tier for EC2 is 750 hours per month for a year. What that means is you can run one T2 micro for 750 hours every month and it'll be free. It doesn't mean uh, you can keep running. It doesn't mean every T2 micro is free. So if you spin up two T2 micros and you run them full time after 300, what's half, what's, what's half of 750? Three, three, uh, 325. No, that's only six. Four. 25, no, three, whatever. Math's not my strong suit because I know how to use computers and I'll open up my calculator in an instant. I'm sorry. Uh, you take half of 750 and that's all it'll run for. Once you hit half of 750, 375, great. That sounds great. 375, after 375 hours, if you run two of them full time, that will utilize all of your 750 hours, okay? And then you will begin you will begin getting charged for them. Now, T2 micros are pretty cheap. I think per month, if you run them full time, they're about seven or eight bucks, I believe. We can go look up the pricing in a little bit, but uh, you gotta be careful about that. But your hours don't get consumed if you turn them off, okay? So if you turn them off, you're fine. Uh, this is if you run them full time, 24 hours a day, it's about 750 hours a month. Uh, so that's how they charge you. So T2 micro, let's go. Okay, key pair login. This is how you're gonna log in. It is required. Okay, key pair name is required. Uh, I can, if I already have some uploaded, I can use that. Um, it's So it says required, but you can select not uh, proceed without a key pair. Uh, what's nice is there are other ways in Amazon through the console and through some other settings and things that they have that you can access this instance, but it's through it's through your web interface. Uh, you've got to set up some other stuff. So you actually don't need a key if you don't want anyone to be able to access remotely like that. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty uncommon uh, for people to want that, but I've, I've done it before. I've had systems that don't have, they don't even allow SSH logging in at all, which is cool um, for security reasons, but a little bit harder to mess with things. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Likely a good thing. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a new key pair because you probably don't have a key pair. I'm gonna create a new key pair. What this key pair is, is this is uh, basically there's a, there's a, there's a lock piece of it. There's a key, there's a private key and a public key. And the public key is going to go on the system. Every system that you spin up that you specify this key pair for the public key will get, uh, set, uh, it'll get set on each of these systems. And basically every time you attempt to log in as, uh, as the proper user, uh, the computer is going to say, Hey, let me look at your, yeah, I'm gonna keep the private key. The user keeps the private key, the server gets the public key. And then uh, when I try to log in, it takes a look at my private key, it matches up with the public key. It says, hey, are these two things compatible? Does this private key unlock this public key? Do they, you know, uh, do they work together? And if so, it lets you in. If not, it does not. And so uh, I'm gonna give it a key pair name. I'll call this uh, stream, no, I'll call it camp cloud, camp underscore cloud underscore key, whatever. You can call it literally whatever you want. Uh, it doesn't matter. Usually I give it a date. Usually I would give it like a 
uh, what's today? 05, 17, 2022. Because you, you likely want to change out your key every so often, but that's usually what I do, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to do camp cloud key. You can, you can leave it as RSA. Uh, yeah, you can leave it as RSA. This is just going to be the encryption type. And then you're going to pick your private key file format. Now you can leave this as .pim. Even on Windows computers, uh, you can leave it as .pim. There was a time when Windows computers needed to use an extra tool to be able to SSH into systems, uh, into Linux systems. But now you don't have to do that. Uh, SSH is available on Windows 10 and up. Uh, so as long as you have Windows 10 uh, and up, you can select PIM. If you're on Mac, select PIM. Uh, if you're on Linux, select PIM. Are the previous classes on demand for people who join late? Yes, DMC. They are on. Uh, they are on Twitch for 60 days. If you hit exclamation point VODs, there's a VODs channel that they go to. The last few days aren't aren't released yet there, only because uh, the service that I, so the music that you're hearing is something called Stream Beats. And the first time, like when you start uploading stuff to Stream Beats, it's completely free. It's, uh, they, they won't, uh, it's made so that you won't get copyright stricken, but they copyright strike you once. Uh, and then you get put on a whitelist. And so right now I'm in that whitelist portion of the VODs channel. Uh, so that's why I haven't released them yet because if I do release it, the uh, the sound is actually cut out from part of the video. So stay patient. We should get on the whitelist just in the next day or two. Um, and so then I'll release them all, but they're all uploaded already. The first like three or four days, uh, the first three or four classes of everything are on there. Um, but the VODs are coming. I'm not behind on VODs. I've kept up with them, uh, but that is the reason. Um, and so, you know, we should be clear in just a day or two. Uh, so you go through, you click these things. So give it a name, leave it as RSA, leave it as .pim, click create key pair. And what it's gonna do is it's going to download the private key. And so put that somewhere where you know where it is. So I'm gonna put it in my downloads folder. Actually, you know, in my documents folder, I'm gonna make a new folder called AWS underscore keys, just so I can easily identify this location. You don't have to do that. This is just what I'm doing. Wherever you wanna put it on your computer, uh, just remember where it is. You gotta know where it is. So now I saved it. Now I have it. Now these these keys, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're important. Um, I'm gonna click it so you can see one a little bit later, so you see what it looks like. Um, but I'll show you how to use it in just a second. Then there's some default networking information. I, you don't need to change anything right now, uh, but this will become more important as we learn about VPCs, as we learn a little bit more about networking. Uh, all you need to do is pay attention to is um, this. Oh, this is new. This is new. This didn't used to be here. Actually, it used to be a different screen and it used to be a little bit harder to use. By default, uh, we can actually lock ourselves out of this instance, uh, but our, our security group needs to be set up for us to be able to SSH in and do what we need to do. So the first thing that's clicked is allow SSH traffic from 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, .0, 0. This is anywhere. This is all IP addresses, period. And so this will allow you to log in from wherever you are. You can lock that down if you are, if you know, if you know your IP address, if you're always accessing from one place, you can, uh, you can update that. I can also allow HTTP and HTTPS traffic from the internet. These are great default options. So if you're gonna be setting up a web server, which we're gonna talk about later tonight, um, you can click these and it'll save you some time. So I'm gonna click all of them just to be, uh, just to be, you know, cool. Make it easy. All right, so in the network section, click them all. Just show midway. What do I have to learn before learning about EC2? Uh, nothing. Nothing. We're going to learn a little bit of Linux um, and we're going to do a lab with it next week. Um, but you don't have to know. I mean, it's helpful to know kind of what the cloud is, um, but you don't have to uh, learn anything. And so you could you could watch this over from the beginning um, and and understand EC2 uh, pretty well. All right. So here's where we get to the storage section. When we get to the EBS section of what we're talking about, uh, I can specify how many I want um, of how large of what storage type. So one times eight gigs, you get, check this out, free tier eligible customers can get up to 30 gigabytes of EBS general purpose storage or magnetic storage. So I get up to 30 gigs for free. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at I'm gonna leave it at eight, but it's 30 gigs total, okay, of storage for free. So I'll leave this at eight, but you can put it on whatever you want. And remember, even if I put it on something more, even if I put it on 50 gigs, I don't pay for 50 gigs of storage here. This just allocates it to me. Uh, you only pay for what you use. So it doesn't really matter what you set it to, but I'm still just gonna leave it at eight just uh, just because. And then GP2 is the default. The general purpose to SSD speeds is the default. Now I could change that up if I wanted uh, to do that. Um, and you could look at that page that I gave you, uh, the documentation to be able to see the differences between them. But see how many other options there are. There, there are a lot of options for what we would wanna use. So you can leave that as default. Great, and I can add more volumes if I wanted. Is there a difference between gigabyte and, uh, so yes, uh, there is a difference between gigabyte, so GB, capital GB, and this. This is a, well, I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. I heard this a long time ago. I dove into it a bit and I trusted the source, but it's been a long time. This is a Gibby bit, okay? Or maybe the other one's a Gibby bit, but I'm pretty sure this is a Gibby bit and or Gibby byte. And I think what the difference is, is a gigabyte, uh, one gigabyte is 1,024 megabytes, okay? Um, yeah, it's 1,024 megabytes. I think Gibby bits are just using 1,000 instead. So instead of having to do, uh, so two gigabytes would be uh, 2,048 and three gigabytes would be 3,050, 62, whatever. I told you math, not great. Um, uh, but yes, uh, so, but you can see that 24 at the end makes the numbers a little bit weird. I think that a Gibby byte is 1,000, okay? Yeah, see, eight gigabytes is 8,192 megabytes. So not exactly 8,000, but I think a Gibby byte is just 8,000 megabytes, I think. And let's see, what is, ooh, got some Quora right here. Good Googling, let's see. Oh, I was wrong. I was, I, I was opposite, opposite, opposite. Okay, there we go. Uh, hold on, let me copy this and show you on screen. And I said, I did, I did disclaimer that it might be the other way around. But you know what's crazy? Storage has gotten so intense. Uh, you can get you can get so much storage for cheap that like nobody cares. <laughs> no one cares. Uh, like like not no one cares, but like you don't want really to think about it that much. But that's super helpful. So what I said was true. Uh, they're just switched around. So GIB is ten twenty four, whereas Giga, where just GB is one thousand. Um, that's helpful. Very very helpful. I don't know if it's Gibby Byte. Oh, it is Gibby Byte. Yeah. So that was right. I got Gibby Byte correct versus Gigabyte, but uh, the values I got swapped around. So thank you. Learn. I confirmed something. I'm gonna rem I'm gonna memorize that now. I will. I won't forget that. And thank you so much for asking the question, uh, Sanuche. Thank you. It's a good question. That's why I said ask questions. That's why I also said I don't know it all. We'll look it up. We'll Google it. Have we have no I. I have no problem Googling. I have no problem telling you. I don't know what the hell that is, uh, but that's helpful. That's helpful. I'm just, I am excited that I kind of knew the answer. All right. So we have our, uh, we have our Gibby bytes uh, at 8,000. Um, yeah, we have our Gibby bytes here at, at, eight, at eight Gibby bytes. And we don't need to add any more volumes, but we could add multiple volumes. Remember multiple EBSs. Uh, for uh, for this, there's also an advanced tab here. Uh, don't really, want, you know, we don't need to worry about that right now. Um, there's some advanced details. I don't want you to worry about these advanced details yet. Uh, this is something that we'll dive into in the lab. Um, there, but there's some cool. Just to show you some of the cool things that you can do is you know you can try to request a spot instance. Uh, when you spin this up, you can do some auto shutdowns and things like that. So shut it down in the evening. So you can see here is like uh, shutdown behavior. If I I can set it to automatically delete if I shut it down. So when I shut it down, I can make it terminate. Uh, if I just you know don't want to have to worry about it, which can be helpful, which can save you money depending on the type of workload you're doing. But yeah, there's a bunch of advanced options that you don't need to mess with right now. And then it gives you a little summary here. So for the most part, we didn't do. We didn't make any changes. All we did was create uh, click new EC2 instance or launch EC2 instance. We gave it a name 
And other than giving it a name and selecting Amazon Linux, we left everything else default. Uh, we, we created a key pair name as well. When we downloaded it. So that's, that's helpful. But everything else, uh, we kind of, well, we didn't leave it default, but you could leave everything default. And once you're done, click launch instance. And in just a few seconds, you will have a, an instance that you can log into. So successfully initiated launch of instance. It might take, uh, it might take a few minutes for it to become accessible, but usually it's pretty quick. So it gave me an ID. I clicked on that instance ID and it takes me back to the EC2 dashboard, the instance dashboard and check this out. Whoops. Uh, it shows my instance here, camp cloud first instance, and it has the instance ID and look, it's pending. It's probably done already, but yeah, so it goes from pending to running and it tells you the size. It tells you a status check. So eventually once it's up and running and everything's working, uh, there's some status checks that it does to, to determine if it's working or not that you get by default, which is kind of cool. And so you'll be able to see its health uh, relatively easily. Uh, if you set up some alarms, you can see if there are things that are actually alarming. Then it shows you what availability zone it's in. So mine is in US East, the US East one region, but the availability zone that it's in is US East one B. Okay, there's I think, I think there's A, B, C and D maybe E as well in US East one, uh, but it's in the B availability zone. This is helpful because maybe you have a system that's using uh, multiple servers and you might want to put one in, in unique availability zones. And so that's super easy to see uh, what it is. Then you get a public IPv4 DNS address. So this is a public address that you can use to access your system. If you want to log into a system, you need to know either it's IP address, which is this right here, or it needs to have a DNS address. We will talk about DNS uh, when we get to the root 53 section. Um, but these are what you're going to use to be able to log in to your system. Okay. This is the, the, the address that you need. Uh, then there's some other information here, the security group that's attached the key name. So if you forget what kind of key you use or which key you used, uh, you can use there and launch time. <laughs> so great. So we have our first instance. It literally takes just a minute or two to spin up. Uh, even if it's very large, it just, it, it spins up pretty quick. Now this is a default instance. There's nothing, there's nothing on it. It's a, it's a kind of a base Linux installation and we need to, we need to log in and do the things that we want to do. Then give me byte is 1024 because people got confused because megabyte was 1024. Now a thousand and GB gigabyte was used. Yeah. Yep. Now a thousand. Yeah. People got very confused. <laughs> it does. It hurts my brain as well. So let's learn how to SSH into these systems. This is going to be the fun hands on part of the day. Uh, were there more slides for SSH? SSH? No. Okay. Let's log in. Let's learn how to use SSH. So again, SSH requires that you use this, this key that we talked about here. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, if you're on windows, uh, you might not have to do this part. Um, well, I'll show you, I will, I'll show you what part I'm talking about. So what I want you to do, if you're on Mac or if you're on uh, Linux, I want you to open up your terminal. Okay. So whatever program you're using as your terminal, I want you to open up if you're on windows and you don't have uh, WSL two installed, go ahead and open up your, com uh, command prompt. I think has it as well. Yeah. Open up your command prompt or PowerShell. Either one works. So if you're on Windows, Command Prompt or PowerShell. If you're on Linux or Mac, open up your terminal. And here's what we're going to do. And this is going to be tough for a lot of people. If you're on Windows and you don't know anything about the command line, or if you're on Mac, open up your Finder or your File Explorer. Okay, I want you to open up your File Explorer and I want you to navigate to where your where, wherever you downloaded that key file, I want you to navigate to that location. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click on uh, uh, mine's is in documents, AWS keys. I want you to go into the folder. So open up Finder on your Mac, open up your file explorer on Linux or uh, Windows, navigate to where this key is just so you don't just so we don't have to worry about uh, command lines. So if you know how to navigate via the command line, go to that location on the command line. But if not, what I want you to do is once you get there, I want you to, uh, I think on a Mac, 
I think it's if you hold command and right click, you will get a open in terminal. Uh, you're gonna open in terminal option in Windows 11. You don't have to hold anything. I think in Windows 10 and below, I think you have to hit Control and you and right click or two finger tap on a Mac or or even on uh, Microsoft uh, laptops and click open in terminal and it should be open in terminal on just about all of them. What this will do is it'll open up on the command line for you. If you've never used the command line before, uh, this is the command line interface. This allows you to interact with your computer by issuing it commands rather than clicking on things. This is not a different space on your computer. This is the exact same computer that you're messing with. So when I click open in terminal, I'm opening up the same location right here. So literally if I do something right here, if I add a file over here, I'll be able to see it over here. If I add a file over here, I'll be able to see it right here. If I modify a file here, I'll be able to see it here and so on and so forth. So first things first, here's what we're going to do. We need to SSH into our system. So I want you to first, uh, we'll need to get our SSH key ready. Uh, actually, uh, let's actually just run into that problem first. First thing I want you to do is go grab that IP address that I was talking about. So go back to your uh, AWS um, console and go back to EC2. If you're already there, you don't need to click into this, but go back to EC2, find the instance that you just spun up. So I just did Camp Cloud first instance, and you're gonna need to, either, you can either click it and go scroll down down here. You're looking for the public IPv4 address. This is what you're looking. You can either scroll to the right and find it here, or go, uh, or, or select it. So click the little you know, thing next to it, and underneath, you should see this pane that has a lot of information and find the public IPv4 address and copy it. So I'm gonna copy 3.90.184.220. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my terminal or to my command prompt. Uh, what kind of cloud projects can you do that look good on a resume? So next week, uh, muckety muck, we will do, we're gonna do like three different EC2 projects. We're gonna do projects with most of the, most of the services that we use. There are a lot. It depends on what you want to do. Um, yeah, there, there are a whole lot of cloud projects, you know, uh, spinning up, uh, an EC2 instance and configuring a web server on it. There's S3 and putting a static website on it. There's. Uh, you know, it's setting up CloudFront in front of it to access it. There's all kinds of things you can do with Lambda and step functions. And there's just so many different types of things you can do um, that will look good on a resume. I think it depends on what kind of job you're trying to get. Um, and while cloud projects are helpful for getting you to learn how to use AWS, the problem with those projects is they don't always provide context to when you would do this thing. Uh, so it can make it kind of tough. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely... I'll definitely try to, to, to think of some good ones, uh, but honestly, that's the million dollar question. Okay, so to initiate SSH, we need to actually initiate the command SSH, all right? But before you do that, actually, just to make sure that your terminal is opened up in the right place, what I want you to do is type in LS. No matter what your platform you're on, type in LS. And when you do, you should see, you might see a lot of files. If you have other things in the directory that you downloaded, uh, the key to, but when you do LS, make sure you see the key that you downloaded. Okay. Make sure you see that key. When you type in LS, LS shows you the files that are inside of this folder. So make sure it's there. If, if you don't see it, that means you did something wrong on this part. You need to uh, find it in your finder or your file explorer, and you need to hold command and right click and look at it. Yep. They're on windows command prompt. Uh, or uh, dir also on Linux command prompt. If you didn't know, you can also do dir here in Linux uh, and see the same information, uh, but just express a little bit differently. Something I find useful typing CMD into the file explorer bar. Yeah, and so launch, uh, launch a new one. Yeah, so you can also do uh, in your file explorer up here on Windows, uh, you can do CMD. And, uh, or is it, uh, I've done this before. How do you do it? So I'm in the file explorer URL bar. Do I delete the whole thing? So let's just do CMD like this. There we go. And it does the same thing. So if you're on, if you're on, uh, windows, find where you want, find where the file is, remove this. 
Someone taught me that. Someone taught me that uh, like last year on stream, and it blew my mind. And then I forgot about it. So thank you for bringing that back up for me. Completely forgot. Oh, der key for Windows CMD. Okay. I have WSL installed, so terminal brings up my Ubuntu. Okay, good question. MRSA, uh, you, can do, you can do one of two things. Uh, if you know the location, um, you can actually open this up in, so there's a couple of different things you can do. Um, yes, if you know how to move it to Ubuntu root folder, do that. If you know how to do it, do that. Uh, or if you, were, if you weren't sure, uh, your Windows machine is mounted inside of WSL and it's located at slash mount C and then your user uh, users with a capital U and then whatever your your username is. So my name is Abru, <laughs> it's A Brooks, but it's Abru, so that's my username. And then in this folder, uh, your your Windows, all your normal Windows folders exist. So like uh, document, like, you know, documents or downloads. So mine is in documents, AWS key. So you can get to your Windows uh, mounts here if you want. And so if I do an LS here, my Camp Cloud PIM is right here. Uh, but yes, if you know how to move it to your, if you know how to move the PIM to your Ubuntu uh, uh, root area, definitely go ahead and do that. Uh, if if you know how to do that, it might, it might be easier. But yeah, once I found out about this, I started using WSL for everything. Once I found out where things were mounted and I knew how to get back and forth between things, uh, it was super duper helpful. So the way that we're gonna issue the command is with SSH. So that's the keyword on all systems to, to initiate SSH. And the way that you are going to SSH is, uh, this is this is the, the this is the uh, anatomy of the command. It's gonna be SSH, then a space. Then it's gonna be your username that you wanna log in as. So the username at IP address. This is the normal setup for an SSH command. Okay, that's, that's normally what you would do. But in this case, uh, we are actually using, so when, when you, if you did it this way, it, it would then ask you for a password and then you would log in. Because we're utilizing, uh, we're utilizing this um, SSH key, we need to pass in the SSH key for our authentication. So the way that we're gonna do that instead is we are going to do, this is, this is correct. It, every each AMI does have a different username. So we're gonna do SSH dash I, that's lowercase I. Then we're gonna type the name of our SSH key. So mine's called Camp Cloud. So, well, so you're gonna say SSH key dot PEM. So you're gonna do dash I and you're gonna type in the name of your SSH key. Then you're gonna do username at IP address that we copied. Okay. So what it's going to look like for us, uh, it's going to be SSH dash I and then a space. Now my, my key is called camp cloud dot PIM. So just like that. All right. Then the username, if you did Amazon Linux, uh, the user is EC2 dash user. This is the name of the user that you're gonna log in as. So EC2 user at, and then you're gonna paste in the IP address that you copied, okay? So here is the command, SSH space, do a dash and then a lowercase i space, Type in the name of your of your PIM file that's should be in the folder that you that you that we just you know we did ls it should be right here so type in the name of that key so I did camp cloud uh, key dot PIM then the username is ec2 dash user that's for everybody if as long as you use Amazon Linux like I did during the setup process that's the user at and then whatever IP address you copied from your uh, from your instance, everyone's IP address will be different. Everyone's will be different. And so if you try to log into mine, you can't log into mine because you don't have my key. Okay. All right. So when I hit enter, it's going to say, Hey, the authenticity of the authenticity of host. And then that's going to be the IP address that you paste it in can't be established. 
Uh, ECDSA, a key fingerprint is this, blah, blah, blah. Are you sure you want to connect? It's basically saying, hey, I've never connected to this system before. Uh, I don't really, uh, you know, it's not a system that I know. Are you sure that you want to connect to it? And this will only ask you the first time you connect to an instance. After you connect, it'll save the fingerprint and it won't ask you it again. It'll, it'll know that this is the system that you connect to. I'm going to type in yes. You have to type in the full word yes. I'm pretty sure. Yes. And I'm on Windows. Hold on. Let's see this real quick. Uh, let's clear this and let's remove it. Uh, on Windows, it lets me in. If you're on a Mac or Linux, you probably got an error. And let me know. Let me know if you got an error. We'll fix it in a second. Uh, but you probably got an error. Would we also do this from Linode too? Oh, so so if you're on, so that's cool. If you're on Linode, uh, you can log in. You can log in from your Linode instance into um, into AWS. The the only issue is that you have to figure out how to get your your key. You have to figure out how to get your key onto your Linode instance. And so uh, there's a couple of different ways to do it. You can SCP it um, or you can, uh, you know, SCP is probably the easiest way to get it there. You can do it from your Linode instance, but you've got to figure out a way how to get the key that you downloaded from AWS onto your Linode instance. Oh, open, open and copy. Yeah, copy pasta. Yeah, so I take that back. Another way you can do it is uh, on your computer, just look at it. Now, I shouldn't show this to you, but I don't really care. I'm going to delete this instance anyway, and this doesn't have any roles or, or anything that I can do anything with, uh, but you can take a look at this key. So I can open it up in a text editor, VS Code or something else. Uh, I can open it up in Notepad. Open up a Notepad. Everybody has Notepad. And this is what it looks like. The name of the file doesn't matter. So basically, the, the contents matter. So you can take this, copy it, and on your uh, Linode instance, you can do something like this. After you copy it, uh, if you've never if you've never uh, modified if you've never modified anything before uh, text on your Linode instance, what you would do is you would uh, all you would do is uh, I'll do it with Nano because Nano is probably there. You type in Nano space and then type in the name of your key. So if you get it wrong, it's fine. But you can say something like I'm going to say uh, Camp Code key.pem uh so touch chris a new empty file um yeah I, you know i usually use vim but i think nano is easier here so you're gonna do nano camp code uh, or whatever you want to call your your key.pem you're gonna hit enter it's gonna look something like this then you're gonna paste so hit control v or command v paste your key into there so yes, using the same key. So take the key that you downloaded on your on your uh main machine and take a look at it Take a look at it, open it up in some type of uh, notepad or something. Take a look at it, copy all the information out of it and then open it. And so when you open up Nano, when you do Nano and the name of the file, it's going to open up a new file for you to modify. And then you paste it in, you hit control to exit. It's con the little arrow right here stands for control. Uh, so you do control X. It's going to say, do you want to save it? I'm going to hit Y for yes. Then I hit enter. So paste it, control X. It's going to say, do you want to save it? You hit Y, then you hit enter and it will save. Let me know if you have any issues with that. How do I find the username of the server? I just started VirtualBox. I'm trying to connect to it from my desktop. So yes, so the the name uh, depends on whatever uh, AMI you use. So we use Amazon Linux. Um, Amazon ha doesn't really have a good place to do this. I don't think Amazon am I usernames. Uh, they don't usually tell you what it is. It's super duper annoying. It's super annoying. So look, they got this page here that you got to go find. And so for Amazon Linux, um, it's the it's EC2 dash user for CentOS. It's CentOS or EC2 user for Debian it's admin Fedora. Fedora or EC2 user, RHEL, EC2 user, uh, Ubuntu is just Ubuntu, SUSE, EC2 user, or root. You know, so you gotta go here to find it. Have I had the change to start with AWS? Oh, okay. So if you're if you're talking about logging into your virtual box uh, machine, uh, you should be able to pull up the GUI for that. So you shouldn't need to log in via SSH. Uh, this is the things that we're doing right now are specifically 
uh, logging into AWS, um, into into the EC2 instance. If you're doing it with a virtual box, you won't even have to, you won't have to log in via SSH because you can access it directly because uh, the screen will pop up for you. All right, so if I try to do the same thing though, check this out. And this, this is an error you might've gotten if you are on Linux or Mac. If I do SSH and I do dash I, yes, a little tip for chat, do not share your private keys ever. I'm gonna delete this server right after this because you all saw my private key and someone who types very fast and screenshotted it might be trying to get into my EC2 instance now. I don't really care, I'll delete it um, in a second. Uh, but I'll do SSH dash I. Okay, I'm gonna do campco.pim, and then I'm gonna do, <laughs> welcome, uh, I, I do, I believe you're in. I genuinely believe you're in. I got all your EC2, oh, no problem. Uh, congratulations, uh, I will now shut down my entire account. Uh, shout out to the alt that for stream. I think you all know who he is by now. Uh, good to see you, dude. Uh, if you want to learn a ton, if you if you come through the DevOps stuff, if you want to do cloud stuff, if you want to learn, if you want to see people build real projects, real dope stuff, please give Mr. The Alt F4 Stream a follow. Uh, he does some really, really, really dope stuff. Uh, learn learned a ton learn a ton from that guy, for sure. Um, all right, but if I try this right now, I'll do the same thing I did before. SSH dash I camp code key dot pm uh, ec2 dash user at and whoops I don't want to paste that I want to I want to grab my uh IP address yeah every, everyone's doing well man everyone's doing I I cannot 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 complain I hope hope everything over there is going great as well I really I really gotta catch up with you and the Toto man we really have to catch up um I'm gonna do this again I'm gonna type in yes and it's going to give me an error and so this is why I was saying, if you had an issue, let me know, uh, because it's gonna give you an error. We're gonna talk about this in a second. Let me just answer this. DevOps, uh, DevOps, it, it, this, 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 there's long answers for this and short answers for this. My answer right now is simply gonna be, uh, DevOps is a is a way of doing things. It's a way of operation uh, that, that helps an organization enable faster development by breaking down silos between departments. So there used to be development and operations and you know, people used to just pass the blame, all this stuff. It's just, it's just a way of doing things that fosters communication uh, and, and, and prioritizes automation and pipelines uh, over, uh, over anything else. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a thing that helps you build software faster or it should at least, uh, but people don't do it. Uh, people always don't do it great, but if we look at this here, it, I actually am not logged into the system. It says, hey, your private key file is unprotected. Uh, and so this actually has to do with permissions. Um, it has to do with permissions. And so this this is a security thing. And it's basically saying, hey, uh, the file that you're using has bad permissions. It's too, it's too permissive. It's too accessible by the world. I'm not gonna let you in because you need to lock it down some. And so this actually has to do with Linux permissions. We're gonna spend some time learning about Linux permissions on Thursday. If you wanna come through to the DevOps course uh, to Waddle, we're going over Linux right now. We'll be learning about users and groups and permissions on Thursday, so you'll know all about this. Uh, but if I do an ls-la um, and, and look at the key code, the, the, the key that I just made, the permissions here basically say uh, that this is this file is readable and writable by me, by the owner. It's readable by anyone in the mastermind group, and it's readable by anyone in the world. Uh, and so that's not good. So if you're on a Mac or Linux, I want you to just do this: C H M O D zero four zero zero space the name of your key file. Okay, I called mine Camp. Yeah. So this is the command that I want you to run. If you're on a Mac or if you're on Linux, chmod 0400 and the name of your file and hit enter. What this does is this this locks down the permissions. This makes it this basically says only I, the user who owns this, can read it, can read this file. And so now if I try to SSH in again, it actually lets me in. Okay. Uh, it's a problem that a lot of people run into that uh I don't see explained a lot in doc in documentation. If you're on Windows, this is this is like one of the few times where if you're on, if you're on Windows, life was easier. 
the way that Windows handles permissions is a little bit different. And so, uh, so, so it actually allows you to log in if you try to access from Command Prompt or from PowerShell. Uh, so kind of nice. Kind of nice. Uh, oh yeah. So you actually. So good question. You actually don't need the first zero in this. I I I, I do it by default. Um, you can use this to this first number. You can use to to tell what type of file this thing is. Um, yeah. You don't. You don't actually. You don't actually need to put the first zero. Uh, it will ignore it if you only put three. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about it, I want to. I, I don't want to go too deep into it because I don't want to be. I don't want to be confusing because it's already confusing. Come through on Thursday. Come through on Thursday, and we'll do a lot with that. Um, yeah, we'll do a lot with that. But it's not necessary. You don't. You don't have to specify this first number. Uh, this first letter, and uh, yeah. So it lets you in. Now we are into a system. The way that you know is you'll get this little last login. Yeah, I've seen three digits. Yep, three digits is completely fine. Um, and these are three digits that matter. So four. So if you're only using three, just do four zero zero. You get a little welcome here. Let's you know the last time you logged in. It gives you a little ASCII art for EC2, and then it tells you a little bit more information. And you know you're in because your prompt will change, and it'll change to EC2 user at the internal, uh, basically IP, and then the internal IP that is set on the system. And that's how you SSH in. You can, you know, as long as you have your key, whatever computer you're on, you can SSH into this instance, and this is how you access instances remotely. All right, so SSH is how you're gonna do it. Um, real quick, uh, so we're, we're already we're already way over time. Uh, all we're gonna do, all I'm gonna show you real quick, just to be a precursor, because next week we are doing a full lab. We're doing lots of different uh, pieces, basically each hour. Uh, we're gonna, it's gonna be three. It's gonna be a three-hour lab next week, so be prepared for three hours next week. We'll do three different things with EC2. So we'll get some uh, proxies and stuff set up. We will. Uh, I'll show you how to rescue an EC2 instance. I forgot what the third one is, but there are three different labs that we're doing next week. Uh, so you'll learn how to actually use this stuff. But something I'll show you really quick is this EC2 instance is a server. It's a server that's sitting out there in the world. And so one of the things we were gonna learn is how to uh, how web servers worked. And so we'll learn that next time. Um, and we're going to set up a web server. Okay. Um, so we'll do it live really quick. I'll show you how easy it is to set up a web server. Uh, you probably don't know, you know, much Linux stuff yet. A lot of you probably don't know much Linux stuff yet. So this is just to just watch this part. Um, you don't need to try to type this stuff in because I'll teach it to you next time. Uh, but Nginx is the web server that's super popular nowadays, and for a lot of technologies, it makes a lot of sense for uh, the modern web, and it's super popular. So we're gonna get it installed. You used to have to do a bunch of crazy stuff, but Amazon Linux is weird. So if you're used to Linux and you're used to doing apt-git or yum, I think that uh, M EC2 is, uh, or Amazon Linux is yum-based, but we're gonna Google it. Amazon Linux install uh, Nginx because they have like a special repository that does some interesting things and the way that you set this stuff up is a little bit easy. You basically have to, it's like, it's like already there and you just have to enable it. Um, no, I don't remember having to do all this. I'm pretty sure it's enable it. Cause I can, I can install it like that, uh, like normal, but I'm pretty sure it already has it on here. Um, but maybe not, maybe I'm tripping. So they're taking you through the whole walkthrough, which is nice. Um, oh, cool. Well, you can just install it. Oh, all right. Things have, I don't believe that either. This didn't used to work. Maybe I'm tripping. All right. So here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna run the first command that you should always run when you get a new system set up. Uh, I'm going to update and actually see, I think it's, it's yum, isn't it? Cool. So this is a yum system. So I'm gonna do sudo yum update. Uh, so what this does is it it gets all the latest packages and things uh, that I need. Uh, it doesn't upgrade all of my stuff, um, but it gets all the updates, things that are available, all that stuff. So the first that's the first thing that you should do whenever you get into this system. sudo yum update. Nginx.org is what I use. Let me see here. Yeah, I I always so. So one, this is also a, a funny thing. I've done so much automation lately. Like I, I almost don't touch systems manually anymore. Uh, but I remember last time I did anything on, on Amazon Linux manually, I remember it, the install process for Nginx being 
odd. Like, like it wouldn't install through Yum, and like I could literally like whatever I ran, like basically just like it wasn't it wasn't setting up an extra repo. It was like a special Amazon command that just like enabled it. And so maybe I'm tripping, but I'll see in a second. But Yum update is the first thing that you should do. Um, and then I'm gonna see what I do. if I do Yum install nginx. I want to see. Um. Okay. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. 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 Maybe this is what I'm thinking of. Uh, but it's not. I tried to do it. It says, "Hey, I don't know what that is. Uh, that's not available in the repos that I know about." Take a look at this command here. It gives me the command to enable nginx one. I'm gonna do that. It's installing nginx for me. And I'll paste in this command here. If you want to copy in and paste this command, we'll talk about what that command is next time uh, and what it's doing. It's gonna ask me if I wanna install these things. I'm gonna hit yes. And it's doing some things. I actually think it starts up Nginx. Oh, it doesn't. Uh, okay, so uh, it installed Nginx for me and now I have to run it. Uh, service Nginx uh, start. sudo so then you type in sudo service engine x start i'll paste this in here as well i'm just going fast for time's sake uh just so you can see it what i want you to see is nginx is simply a web server that's all it is we'll learn about web servers next time as well uh but what it does is it serves content over the web uh, a web server a server is just a computer uh, that has software on it that is able to serve content over the internet through web protocols and so a server simply is a piece of software that sits on a server and it listens for information over the web and it accepts it it accepts these requests and it determines how to handle them it, it routes things to where they need to go and it responds accordingly now that we've done this because I have uh, this IP address, oh, I didn't have my clipboard manager turned on. Uh, if I take the IP address that we copied here and I paste it into my browser now, it will actually give me a real web page. It'll say, welcome to Nginx on Amazon Linux. And now I have a page that's actually serving up web content. Um, and so this makes it super easy for you to make a website I just want to see if that was on there. Vim slash uh, var dub dub dub. Okay, it's in a different place. Um, Etsy, Nginx. Oh, I forgot this isn't my Vim. Uh, CD, Etsy, Nginx. Where's the new default Nginx stuff at? Uh, module logs. Where's the home? stream user share nginx html all right let me change something here under the head to it's so weird not having ah all right um, it doesn't have my key. I changed all my key bindings. This is the problem when you change your key bindings. I shouldn't do that yeah, because now I'm like thrown all the way off. But look at this. I'm Aaron. And now my friends, we are web developers. Look at that. I'm Aaron. I, I just modified a web page live on the air. To, with my name, I set up a server. I I'm serving a website, and I check. Look at that. I'm a develop. I'm a web develop. I'm a web dev. I'm web dev. I'm web dev now. Okay, I did it. But just to show you that this is a real web page, that was HTML that I was modifying there. Um, I, it's pretty like it's actually a pretty simple process to do. Um, but we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn our, our first lab is gonna be literally this uh, understanding why we're doing it and how we're doing this and setting up a server and getting ready to go. But this is what um, this is kind of the power of AWS. Just like that, I I can set up a system, get something installed, and start serving out websites. So you could. I'm not joking with you. You could go make some money by being a web host. You could say, hey. 
people, if you want a website, once you have your website made, I will host it for $5 per month. And you can go right off here and set up a web, a web server and put people's websites on there and just keep it up to date and make sure it stays up and you can make money hosting. I still make, I still have people that I host their websites for. Okay. Some of them are a little bit more complex uh, than this, but I still have people I host websites for um, that I make some money off of. So just to teach you uh, something, yes, full stack for sure. 100% full stack there, uh, all the way to the back end, all the way to the front end. You know, like even it's so beautiful. Look at that beautiful CSS that's in there. Uh, super nice, but cool. What I want you to take away from today, a lot of information today, EC2, know that it's scalable, uh, on-demand compute instance. It's got instance types or instance classes uh, that each give you a different value. Some of them are better with RAM. Some of them are better with storage, faster storage. Some of them are better with compute. Some of them utilize uh, some of them utilize graphics uh, processing for things as well. But you have instance classes and instance sizes, those mediums, large, extra large. Those determine how much you pay for the instance. It determines how much it charges you per hour or by second. Um, uh, also, that EC2 instances are backed by two different types of storage, both instance stores and EBS. Instance stores are ephemeral storage. When you shut down the instance, that storage, the stuff that's on that storage goes away. You lose that stuff forever. But EBS stays available. It's non-ephemeral. It sticks around. Uh, EBS can also be detached from instances and connected to other instances. Uh, multiple EBS volumes can be connected to a single EC2 instance that's in the same availability zone. Um, but you cannot connect uh, multiple EC2 instances to a single EBS uh, volume. Doesn't work that way. It's only one works in the other uh, fashion, the other relationship. Uh, we learned that there's a couple different types, uh, SSDs, HDDs. We, we saw a couple different storage uh, types. Uh, they cost different amounts of money. Uh, we talked about the, the EC2 uh, payment model or the uh, the, the way that they, the pricing model, the way that they, the ways that they charge you, you have on demand, which is the most expensive, uh, but you get it when you want. It is the most popular, uh, but again, the most expensive. So whenever I'm ready to spin up an instance, I can grab it whenever I want, or I can save myself some money. If I know something's going to be long running, and I'm going to have it for a while. I can you know, right up front. I can uh, reserve that capacity long term. There is a commitment there uh, on demand. No commitment. Uh, uh, yeah, on demand, no commitment, but reserve is a one or three year commitment for being able to do these things. There's also a couple different payment options inside of that. Uh, then you have spot instances where you set a price. You set a price that you're willing to pay. And whenever the price for compute goes below that, uh, you can gain access to instances that you want. And once it goes above, you can lose instances uh, that you that you have. Uh, those aren't guaranteed, um, but it can be a cheap way to get some computing done, to get some workloads uh, completed for a, a pretty low price. It's another way to help you manage your cost. Then there are dedicated instances as well where there are no other tenants on that virtualized space. It's just you on that system. And so that's pretty darn expensive. Uh, know that the only way that you can log in or the, the, the not only way, but the main way to natively log in to your EC2 instance is uh, not with password auth. You need SSH keys. Uh, SSH key pairs are the way that you log in by default. Um, and so you're gonna need to, to figure out how to use those. I have uh, some more instructions that I've included for using those. So go through the material that I've added in the Google Classroom. It'll help you understand that a little bit better. It's okay if you were lost for most of this class and you didn't get to get logged in. Uh, there's there's some stuff in there that should help you get logged in and we will, we will practice getting logged in some more. Um, other than that, um, oh, I also know that EBS has snapshots. Remember that those, those snapshots allow you to take quick backups, easy backups, uh, and you can restore from those uh, from those snapshots. They're point in time uh, backups, and that they are incremental, so it's not cumulative. If you take three snapshots of a 20 gig image, it's not 60 gigs of, of storage that you're paying for. You're only paying for uh, the differences in between them um, storage wise. So it's it's you know take take as many snapshots as you would like. Um, yeah, take as many snapshots as you would like uh, as you need, not like as you need, so you don't have to pay for anything. Um, 
yeah, go to this, go to the slides. There's a bunch of extra information in the slides because I wanted to cover a little bit more, but I'll get that stuff squeezed in to the labs. No problem, but you can go ahead and try some of this stuff yourself. If you're unfamiliar with Linux, I highly, or some basic Linux commands, when we're doing the EC2 lab, we'll be doing a lot of this stuff. I highly recommend that you either go back and watch, uh, either last, uh, watch last Thursday's, um, uh, Thursday class or watch yesterday's. If you watch yesterday's coding course, uh, we, we spent some time learning, uh, basic Linux commands. So watch yesterday's coding course, and that'll get you up to speed on a lot of these basic Linux, uh, commands so that you can get around your EC2 instance, and it'll make next class much, much easier for you. If you spend some time watching that. Yes, Beverend, uh, service, sudo service Nginx start. Thank you so much, Unknown, for passing that along. Is Nginx used in cloud by default? Uh, no. Uh, so there are a number of web servers. Uh, Nginx is probably not even the most used. Uh, Apache is probably the most used web server out there. It's uh, it's pretty dope. There, there are a couple options. Uh, Nginx is really good for the type of computing that we do now with microservices and all this uh, all this proxying and stuff. Uh, it's really good for, for, for that. So people are using it a lot more. So it's become pretty darn large. Um, but it's not, it's not by default. You, you will run into Apache as well. Uh, and they're good for different things. Apache is really good for dynamic stuff. Uh, things like WordPress and stuff work better with Apache. Um, and most of the internet is run off of WordPress. So you can't really get around it. Um, and Nginx is blazingly fast for like static stuff, um, and proxying and things like that. For hosting a personal website, do you prefer AWS compared to other providers? Okay, great question about personal sites. Um, I prefer, I do prefer, there are free options for being able to run your site. I do prefer, we're gonna learn about S3 in two weeks. Uh, I prefer to run my, per, my personal sites if I can build it in a way that it's static uh, I, I, I prefer to run them off of S3 because it's almost no money to do so. It's it's basically free. Um, that's my preference. There are a bunch of options to run your website for free. GitHub Pages is is probably one of your better options. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well versed in AWS, so it's easy for me to do something like that. But if you're not, uh, I think dealing with another provider like GitHub Pages might be the answer for personal websites so that you don't have the overhead of managing these things. So web servers are required to run applications, kinda, but yes, yes, they, they are They are required to run applications. You need a system that's gonna do the processing. There's some, there's a, put an asterisk by that, but yes, a web server is needed to run an application. Nginx is much more lean compared to Apache, yep, and has slightly more simple config syntax. I agree, I think it's, I think it's simple to, simpler to configure. Uh, Netlify is free. Yes, Net Netlify is dope. I like Netlify. <laughs> also, Cloudflare pages. I haven't used Cloudflare pages, but uh, Cloudflare is dope as well. So, lots of different options out there on that. All right. So, as you can see, lots of information. Uh, I've included some documentation uh, in the classroom about a few different things. Go through it. Formulate some questions. Uh, feel free to ask whatever questions you would like uh, as time goes on. Make sure you get the answers to the things that are confusing to you. Again, we're diving right into labs with this next week. So like you'll get more hands on with the service. It's not the last time you'll see the service. Uh, yes, there's a lot of information in it. It's okay. P pick up what you can pick up, you know, every day, every day you're attempting to get better is great. Uh, even if you just learned one little piece today, that's progress. Progress is all that matters. Progress is all that matters. Doesn't matter how slow the progress is. Progress is all that matters. Some days you'll be a whiz and you'll understand everything. Some days uh, will be terrible because I'll be tired and I won't teach things well, or I'll say things in a weird way, or we just, me and you might just not be vibing that day and you won't pick up everything. Keep going. Keep going. Pick up what you can. Rewatch. Go go listen to someone else talk about EC2. Go go Google and go to YouTube and watch. Hear someone else talk about it. Or or if you got a little bit of money, I highly recommend picking up a Cloud Guru, a uh, an a Cloud Guru account. Uh, super dope site. Um, and you know supplementing or or going there full time. It doesn't 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 matter to me. I just want you to be able to learn this stuff. Uh, find what works for you. Find what works for you. I uh, highly recommend, like, if you if you want to do cloud stuff, like, I, I, have a, I have a membership to this because they do, like, uh, weekly updates on all the new stuff. And I used to use that all the time. I used to, like, every week I would just sign in and watch all the new stuff. It was all in one place. 
and it worth every penny. And it's like I pay like two hundred some or three hundred some dollars a year, uh, but you can get it for cheaper than that, I think. Um, and it's you know it's pretty it's pretty dope. But uh, I hope you learned something today. Um, if you're like I said, next week in this in this course, we'll be doing we'll still be on EC2 purely, but we'll be doing some EC2 labs all class. Um, and so I'll leave you with a lot after that to kind of work on on your own. Um, you'll actually have homework after next class. After we do the labs, you'll have some homework to do some things yourself, which should be helpful uh, and not just material to go over, some real things to do. Uh, if you're interested in Linux, on Thursday, we're back to Waddle. We're, uh, we're talking about uh, this, our DevOps anthology course, uh, and we'll be doing users and groups and permissions and like file operations and stuff. So come on through if you want to learn that stuff on Thursday. And then Monday of next week, uh, we are back again with Camp Code. We'll be learning. Uh, we're actually going to be writing Go now, finally. We spent, we spent time yesterday learning about the command line so that you all knew how to run some stuff. And we'll actually be writing our first real Go stuff. We'll be learning all about strings and displaying output uh, on Monday. So come on through for that if you want to learn a little bit of Go. But that's it. That's it for today. I need to get out of here and go relax. Uh, yes, a cloud guru was purchased by Pluralsight. Um, but let's see who's online. I I'm cool. I'm cool with that. Uh, well, first, whoa, let's hear me. Uh, first, who bought? Who did a cloud guru buy? They bought Linux Academy. So a cloud guru bought Linux Academy. Yeah, and then were purchased by Pluralsight. It was dope. Yes, you should stop the instance. Good job, thank you. Yes, actually, we don't need this instance, so you can either stop it or you can terminate it. If you wanna mess around with it, feel free to not delete it, but the way that you stop it, very, very easy. Thank you so much, uh, Beverend. All you gotta do, very, very easy. Right click, so, so go to your EC2 instance dashboard, so go to your service, EC2, find your instance, go to instances, find it, right click it, and stop it. That's all you got to do. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't add a bunch of stuff to it. So we get uh, 30 gigs for free. So you're not gonna have to pay anything storage wise, but simply go through and stop it and make sure it stops. So every so often you're gonna have to click this refresh button because it's going to take a little while to stop. And once it's stopped, uh, it'll be off of there. And you can see here, it says stopped. Um, so yes, make sure you go in and stop it. That's I, I need to, I need to add that as an alarm to, Hey, Turn off what we did. Save yourself some of those free hours so that you can spin up more and more instances and try more and more things. Perfect, Julian. Awesome. Who are we going to head over and raid on this good, good evening? Let's see if we can find somebody new. Let's see. Six is left. Mayan Wolf, destroyer, destructor function. Uh, I mean, we we uh, we can write we can write a destructor function for uh, for lambda once we get to the lambda section. Um, did we raid Melody Dev? I try I I as often as possible. Uh, I do try to raid women in tech um, because it, it's important. It's important. I've been in tech for a long time. Uh, you don't see many women, and I really want to encourage. Uh, I really want to encourage uh, as many people as possible to get in tech, but definitely women and being able to provide some support here on Twitch is dope. So yeah, so Mind Wolf, I don't think we've ever raided Mind Wolf. I don't think I know Mind Wolf. Maybe I've seen the stream once before. Uh, let's head over and say hello. So if you have any, if you have any women in your life who is looking for a career change or interested in something, push them towards tech, push them towards tech. Uh, seriously, like as we build, as we build products, like, you guys would be like when you really think about it and you when you really see tech in action like it, it means a lot like tech really affects our lives uh, it, like really affects our lives and as many people that can be a part of it as possible is is actually super important different perspectives all that is actually it's genuinely important so push as many people as you can if you know any women in your life who want to learn tech push them into it get them into it for sure that spell this right all right peace out everybody i'll see you on thursday if you want to come through um, otherwise, you know, I'll see you when I see you. We're going to be out of here in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Have a great night.